All right, thank you. Uh, good evening and welcome to the June 14th meeting of the Litchfield School Board. We are at the CHS Auditorium tonight due to some scheduling conflicts for Wednesday. Um, I'll call the meeting to order and um, pledge of allegiance. Where is it? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do have any changes to the agenda? So there were a couple of uh, updates that I just want to draw the board's attention to. Um, bear with me one second. Underneath my comments, I have livened up a link to a document uh, regarding the middle school schedule and some combined bus routes for next year, and we'll be going through that in detail with the board, but that was just livened up a little while ago. Um, and then underneath the uh, old business for coronavirus review and update, we have linked a one-page 21-22 uh, reopening plan. We're calling this version 1.0. Uh, we expect that it's going to continue to evolve over the summer, but this is the board's first glimpse at this, and um, we'll be walking through that in detail. And again, it's a, it's a living document that we expect is going to develop over the summer. So those are two updates for you. Great. Thank you. That, I'll provide a summary of non-public actions from June 2nd, 2021. Mrs. Hirschberger made a motion to approve the non-public minutes of May 19th, 2021. Mr. Borks, Mr. Burke seconded. The motion carried 5-0-0. Mrs. Harrison made a motion to accept the nomination of Adrienne Val Naylor as GMS nurse at a salary of $41,115 for the 2021-22 school year. Mrs. Ames seconded and the motion carried 5-0-0. Mrs. Harrison made a motion to accept the nomination of Haley Legasse as a GMS special education teacher at a salary of $40,997 for the 2021-22 year. Mrs. Ames seconded. The motion carried 5-0-0. Mrs. Ames made a motion to accept the nomination of Courtney Magoon as GMS music teacher at a salary of $47,246 for the 2021-22 year. Mrs. Harrison seconded. The motion carried 5-0-0. Mrs. Harrison made a motion to accept the nomination of Elizabeth Lennon as a CHS science teacher at a salary of $59,723 for the 2021-22 year. Mrs. Ames seconded. The motion carried 5-0-0. Mrs. Harrison made a motion to accept the resignation of Heather Davis, CHS Spanish teacher. Mrs. Ames seconded. The motion carried 5-0-0. Mr. Burke made a motion to approve a full-time position for a set teacher by combining the part-time computer and, and part-time enrichment positions. Mrs. Ames seconded. The motion carried 5-0-0. Um, do we have any presentations and recognitions? Not this evening. All right. Community forum. Mm -hmm. Yep. So I'm going to open the link to the community uh, public comment page. Great. And so I am in that link by myself. I don't see anybody else in here at this time. Okay. Um, for if anyone is watching, um, we're not live. So I guess it doesn't matter. But we <laughs> we are in the CHS auditorium. And if you've missed community forum but wanted to provide any feedback or have any questions, you can always email the school board at schoolboard at litchfieldsd.org. Correspondence? Yeah, there were two. I thought there was a third, but the first one that Michelle I sent you, I believe, um, was not originally uh, forwarded to everyone. Uh, the first one I sent you. Is that the one from Ms. Valencourt? Correct. Yep. So Deb Rice, like I said, sent two. Um, her concerns both surrounded the uh, usage of masks outdoors. Uh, very simply says, as a fitness instructor myself, there are so many ways to have active and keep kids distant without masks in the heat. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, there was a sub at GMS on this particular day that was hot, and this person was not aware that the children could play with their mask off if they were distance. And that has been clarified with that sub, and has been taken care of. The 
second one was also from from Deb Rice, and it was actually an article that was sent to us. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the person's title was who sent it. And notifying the schools that they could allow children to be outdoors activities without masks. And it's uh, an article that Dr. Jenna had already forwarded to us. And those are the two correspondents. superintendent comments. Excellent, thank you. So the first uh, thing I want to comment on is uh, the graduation update. So the high school does a nice job of summarizing the, uh, the future plans for the graduates. So graduation was held outside on the field Friday night. It was a little bit cool, um, but cool is better than hot, I think. And it did start to sprinkle a little <laughs> bit at the end, but I think it moved everybody right along out of the parking lot and onto <laughs> the parties at various households. So. Um, but we have 107 students who are in the, uh, the class of 2021. 100 of them were uh, graduate graduates the other night, and there were six students who graduated from Londonderry Night School or the High Set program. I have one from the High Set program to add up to 107. Um, so 66% of this year's class is on to a four-year school, and 15% are planning to attend a two-year college. That's 81% attending either a two- or four-year school. The military has uh, one student enrolling, which represents 1%. There are six students who are going into career education. There are eight students going into workforce or career training. There's one who is pursuing an apprenticeship. And then three students are intending to take a gap year, um, which is becoming more and more popular across the country with students taking time between high school and post-secondary plan. Uh, so that adds up to all of our students. Um, and then during the award ceremonies that were held earlier in the week, there were 18 students who were recognized and they received a total of $35,850 in local scholarships. So uh, the class of 21 is off to good things um, and on their way. Great. I was somewhat surprised actually to see the 66% the headed towards a four-year college program, but I. I'm guessing that's partly because of COVID and the unsure, you know, the uncertainty of what happens next year and what college programs are going to look like. Um, I'm not, I don't think. We're I going disagree to be with that. 100. I thought it was going to be higher. I disagree. I am hmm. seeing more and more kids saying, "I'm going to do my basic classes at a community college," oh, that's and I, that's what I've heard over and over again that I'm going to go to a community college, get my, and which makes sense yeah. if instead of yeah. earning a hundred thousand right. dollars. Right, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm no, just, I think the tides are changing. We've, you know, one of our school board goals, I think, when we when I first joined the board, was to have, um, you know, close to 100 percent attend a four year college, and it's just it's times just are changing. Sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can we obtain the numbers from our cohort group as far as what their percentage? We certainly were? could. Yeah. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. I thought that report was great. Um, mm -hmm. I hadn't seen one like that presented. Um, which one's that? that was it? I mean, just there was some information there that I hadn't seen before, so I thought that was great. Great. Any other questions for Mike about the graduation report? All right, transportation update. Uh, so for transportation update, we had had a conversation just regarding what our obligation is relative to transportation. And so I just wanted to draw the board's attention to RSA 189.9. Um, and basically, the, the law seems pretty clear that any students attending private schools up to and including the 12th grade are entitled to the same transportation privileges within a town or district as are provided for pupils in public schools. So because we do have uh, private schools that are within the town border, mm -hmm. we are required to provide transportation privileges to any of the students who attend there. So we'll continue to meet the law and uh, to provide the services. Um, and we'll work with first student to make sure that the routes and so forth are arranged in a way that um, make sure that our students, uh, that the public school students have, um, you know, the more favorable way of that route taking place, I guess. So uh, that's been the case in the past, but we'll continue to do that as we work forward. Great. 
Thank you for the update. Yes, you're welcome. Uh, for volunteer orientation, just an update for the board, we talked about this. So um, the volunteer orientation is largely done online through a series of check checklists that people do. We intend to do that on an annual basis so that people are signing off annually. That's something that they're aware of. Um, and then our principals or whoever it is that is hosting the volunteer, uh, they, they continue to do an on-site orientation at that time. So for example, um, dance volunteers, the principals would meet with the parents or the volunteers who have shown up. And just to give a quick overlay about job responsibilities and what they need to do that night and what's specific to that. So, um, so the orientation is sort of the global orientation of all the rules and policies which can be accomplished through a Google form that we're developing. So parents can simply complete the Google form and put their stamp on it and then we'll have the record that they completed it. Um, and then on site when they come to volunteer they will have a, have a meeting with the supervisor and an opportunity to ask questions. So I just wanted to pause and see if the board had any questions or follow up on volunteer orientation. I think it's great that you're allowing, you know, the forum is going to be online and the training is going to be online. I think that's great. <coughs> All right, so next we have our enrollment update, and uh, it's the same document that we've been working off. You can see that we've added June 11th um, in. Mm -hmm. The kindergarten has continued to gain students, so we're now up to 84 uh, students in kindergarten. The first grade has stayed steady from the last meeting at 83. Uh, the second grade has been steady all along at 79. Um, the third grade has fluctuated um, from 87 down to 86 and now back up to 87. And the fourth grade is, um, is staying steady at 94, which leaves them three students off the trigger mark in fourth grade. Um, third grade has already hit the trigger and the teacher is planned. Um, the second grade is below the trigger by five students. The first grade is bellying up to the trigger, but it has not yet occurred. And the kindergarten is above the trigger and um, has taken one of the transfer students from... Teachers. Well, sorry, one of the transfer teachers, that is correct. So at the current, the current enrollment numbers have us at 22 total staff, which is identical to this year's total staff. Any questions or comments on the enrollment? Have any students withdrawn yet? Like if I was sold my house in May and I'm planning on moving in July, has that started happening yet? So we have asked for those uh, families to report into us. Mm -hmm. I think when you look at the May 18th numbers, that, that was after we put a push out to say, if you know you're moving, please let us know because the seats are very valuable. Yeah. Um, because you'll notice that we dropped one in kindergarten, mm -hmm. we dropped two in first grade, uh, we dropped one in third grade and we dropped one in fourth grade, mm -hmm. but then they sold their house to somebody with kids, I guess, because <laughs> the numbers yeah, picked back up again. So, you know, it is that kind of game. Somebody moves out and somebody else moves in. And, you know, you could have a family of two that moves out and a family of three that moves in. So we're watching it very, very closely. As we all know, we're belly right up to those enrollment numbers. Okay. Um, heat wave update. Yep, just wanted to give the board an update. So remember that one week ago tonight, we were all sweltering in 90 degree heat. Um, and then the, uh, you know, by the end of the week, the heat had broken to a pretty comfortable graduation. Today was actually a little bit chilly. Um, and so you just never can tell. But throughout the heat wave, we were continuing to monitor uh, conditions. I was on the phone with the principals throughout the day just checking in to make sure that everything was fine, communicating with staff about our plans, the best way for them to manage the heat in their own individual classrooms. Um, and we came through it okay. Uh, you know, there, there really were no heat, um, heat related illnesses seen until possibly on the third day. Um, there were a few students who did not feel well and were sent home on Wednesday morning. Remember it was a half day to begin with and uh, it's hard to tell sometimes if it was heat related or something else that you know occurred during the heat, but there were no uh, heat exhaustion, heat strokes, anything like that that occurred. The buildings were warm. The warmest classroom, I believe, was at 86 degrees. Um, there were other classrooms on the second floor of Campbell that were around 84, 
four degrees, but um, they were, you know, manageable. Um, and again, we, we made all sorts of adjustments to the ventilation system. What did not help us is that it did not get cool at night. So when that heat came in, you know, the nighttime only cooled down to about 75, which is not what you want. You'd love to have, a, you know, a 65 degree nighttime so that you can bring that cool air in. So we were able to bring fresh air in, but it wasn't cool fresh air. So um, I think we did the best we could and we were in constant communication, water breaks, et cetera. Um, one thing to share with the board is that uh, Corey and I were with Tom actually down at the middle school on Friday and there were three classes that came walking along on a mass break. Um, and all three classes had about 20 students in it. And about 50% of each class on the mass break was wearing their mask outdoors. The kids were just walking along, skipping, tossing footballs, chatting um, on their break from the classroom. And yet they were still, half the students were still wearing a mask. So we found that to be interesting um, because we do hear a lot of concerns about masks and the, and the children have really adapted very well to it and are just sort of going with the flow. Um, so even when given the chance to take the mask off, they, not all are doing that. But I'd love to take any questions the board may have or if there were concerns relative to the heat wave. There were, there were other districts that did early dismissals, um, but you know, I talked with a uh, neighboring superintendent who had an old school house with a third floor where classrooms were in the 90s and that's why they decided to release. That wasn't similar to our situation, so we uh, stayed the course and, and got through the day. Any other comments or questions? No, I just, I, I would say the teachers did a great job adapting to the situation. I think that they, you know, I heard of popsicles being handed out. There was a lot of ice cream, or maybe ice cream sandwiches, just different things that they were doing that was creative to cool the kids down. and. My kid came home on a sugar high happy <laughs> each day, so um, I, I think they did a great job adapting. The building administrators also did well with it. Yeah, my my kids are fine. Popsicles. 48? I gave out 48 popsicles, and that's all I wanted. I was crankier than the kids. Um, all right. If, if you hear of something, let us know, but I, I do think it's one more example where sometimes the adults, I'm, I know I'm more bothered by the heat now than I was when I was a kid. Um, and so I think we just you know have to keep in mind that they're pretty resilient and, uh, and, and our staff are also, as you said, um, aware of the situation and taking steps <coughs> to make sure that they are helping along with the scenario. So. Uh, Revote on hiring. So I believe at a previous board meeting, the board gave me authority to hire between, um, I think it was June 15th. 17th. 17th. Ju June 17th. So we're looking for that to be modified to tomorrow, just in case we get somebody. I don't have anybody in the pipeline yet, so I, I guess I could wait till Thursday. But uh, since we moved the board meeting, we just wanted to make sure that we had the ability to offer contracts uh, in the interim. So. I'll make a motion to authorize the superintendent to offer employment contracts to new hires from June 14th. It says June 14th on the agenda. 15th, but that's 15th. right. 15th, yep. okay. To August 30th, 2021. Sorry. Ryan seconds. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, abstain? Five zero zero. Perfect. And then the last thing is, uh, and, and Tom is with us, so I'm going to just talk through this memo and then I'm going to ask Tom to speak for a few seconds to it. But you have a memo uh, that was authored uh, talking about the shift in, uh, a shift in the middle school schedule. So the board is certainly aware that the middle school schedule is um, very tight when it comes to meeting the New Hampshire minimum standards for school approval. Um, and you know, as we're considering that, the only way to, to address it was to add time at the middle school. To add time, we also have to very carefully consider our collective bargaining agreement. So there's some clear stipulations in there that we've uh, achieved with our faculty um, and have been very successful in, in working under the terms of that contract. Um, so we had to really examine that carefully to make sure that any proposal that we made uh, kept us honorable to the contract. So um, 
So we've come up with a plan that we would like to begin at the start of the next school year. So a couple of the benefits of that plan are really increasing the length of the student's school day. It's going to go from a six and a quarter hour school day to a six and three quarter hour school day. So we pick up um, time on campus of about 30 minutes through this plan. We're also going to increase the number of instructional hours that all students will have and that will allow us to better meet the New Hampshire minimum standards for grades five through eight. Honestly, grades five and six have an elementary standard of 945 hours. That has been relatively easy for us to obtain over time. It's seventh and eighth grade, which are on a secondary standard and have to achieve 45 additional hours or uh, 990 hours under the uh, minimum standards. That's the piece that has been our challenge and difficult for us to obtain. We want to continue to provide time for students to eat school breakfast each morning and we think that because this is an earlier start day that there may be more families who will take advantage of the school breakfast program because it'll be an earlier start for their middle schooler to get out of the house. Um, we also want to allow time for all students to have a movement break during best. We think, uh, based on feedback that we've heard from parents here at, at the last board meeting, um, that we have an opportunity to provide movement break during the best block. Also streamlining bus routes from three trips around town each morning and afternoon to only two trips around, around town. So it's kind of been a handcuff for us by running a high school route, a middle school route, and an elementary route. You have to allow enough time for the buses to accomplish all those routes and therefore the bus routes have not been convenient or um, it not been convenient, let's just leave it at that. So we think that we can combine the bus routes and achieve a much greater level of efficiency for our students. So what are the details? In order to do that, we are proposing that we have a single middle school and high school bus route. We anticipate that it would start around 6.45 each morning possibly as early as 6.40 if we need a little bit of extra time for one route, but the goal is to start around 6.45. The route would pick up all eligible students in both Campbell and the middle school and arrive at the middle school by 7.15. So drop-off will begin at 7.15. The buses will begin to discharge at that point and parents who are doing drop-off will be able to drop off at 7.15 and be on their way. After the buses have dropped the middle school students off, they will then come over to Campbell and they will drop off the high school students by about 725. Um, now historically, each Campbell <coughs> run has had fewer than 10 riders on it. We don't anticipate that that will shift or change. Um, many of the high schoolers take advantage of older siblings or drive themselves to school and we think that will continue to be the case. But if they drop off here at 725, classes begin at 735, so there's plenty of time for the students to come in, also access breakfast, and get to their period one class on time. Currently, high school students are arriving close to 7 a.m. and are, are sitting in the cafeteria waiting for school to start. So we do think that this will be um, a, a better, more efficient way uh, for us to pick students up in the morning. So, um, Classes then, shifting back over to LMS, so classes will begin at 722 with the first period containing announcements and lasting a few minutes longer than other instructional periods. I believe that they've built in about four minutes to the first period class so that they can do announcements, pledge of allegiance, take attendance, and then get down to business. All other classes will be uh, approximately 53 minutes in length, so they're adding to the instructional time across the school. Uh, with the, and I say about because uh, some of the periods may be a little bit shorter than that. We're still trying to get the final schedule, uh, the schedule finalized. Best block is going to be modified to ensure that it is instructional and all students will receive either special services or personalized support or enrichment along with a planned movement break. So those are the things that we're working into the best block. So grade level schedules will be finalized and shared with parents soon. Lunch will be 30 minutes in length for grade five and 25 minutes for grades six, seven, and eight. The fifth graders simply take longer to eat and especially um, to get accustomed to the offerings that are available at the middle school. Dismissal will begin each afternoon at 2.05.
with afternoon announcements followed by buses departing from LMS to CHS by 215. So if the buses are pulling out of the middle school by 215, they will be here at Campbell and queued up along the front uh, driveway by 225 when the school dismisses. And then the high school students will be able to board the buses directly. We will then stop student and parent traffic from departing, so the buses get first dibs out of the parking lot. Um, and so they'll be clearing the high school by 2.30, and then all students will be transported home. And again, we're estimating a 30 minute run, so those routes should be completed by three o'clock, which is plenty of time for the buses to then report to Griffin uh, for their afternoon run. I haven't yet determined, but if the buses are in place at Griffin a little bit earlier, it may help us to speed up that dismissal process also, because as we know, there's a, there's a time lag between parents and buses um, that we may be able to uh, shave some time on by having the buses cleared and on site a little bit earlier. That still remains to be seen. Next year's gonna be a little different to it. You probably won't have as many people dropping their kids off and picking them up. Because mm -hmm. right now the pick up and drop off at GMS is like well, it's yeah. it's, it's three long. parent lines. I think three color coded uh, drop off and pickups that occur, um, and so maybe that can get down to two and speed that along a little bit. Mm -hmm. So in a nutshell, that's what we have come up with. Now I'm going to put Tom on my screen and ask him if there's anything I missed, Tom, or anything that you want to add or compliment about that. Yeah. So thank you, Mike. Um, First of all, I, I think this has sort of been a long time coming. I, I, we've heard the conversations over a number of years about the instructional minutes of middle school have been aware of that. And I think this is uh, this is definitely going in the right direction. It's gonna add, when you add those those minutes up, those 30 minutes every day, multiply that out over the course of the year, it provides a pretty nice buffer that we haven't had for a long time in middle school. So that to start, um, I just wanted to highlight a couple of things that, um, that are in the document. And um, the first one is the uh, the best block, just a little bit on that. So um, we've had the best block for a while at the middle school. We've called it enrichment. We have we have best now. Um, and I think uh, Mary Whitman talked about um, iReady and we're, we're looking as a district at, um, at some technology that is going to definitely enhance some of the enrichment work and remediation work we do with students. We also wanted to, in looking at our schedule, um, avail our staff to do more enrichment and more remediation with kids on a more personalized basis. So I think um, by shifting our schedule and uh, the other thing that's not in this document that we've been able to do by, by looking at our schedule is do some minimizing um, we've talked in some of our meetings when I've been there about just the complexity of the middle school schedule and the number of switches and so forth. Um, in doing the revision to the schedule, we have been able to minimize, especially in grades seven and eight, some of those switches. And um, also that's allowed us to do more with, with the best block um, in, in availing the teachers during that time. Uh, the other piece is the movement break. Mike mentioned, and um, you know, you're looking at a guy who has a lot of energy and gets the movement thing, and um, the student sitting all day is is a challenge. We, we, we get that. Middle school bodies are awkward. Um, they need to get up and move around. And so by sort of integrating that during the best time, um, we have some teams that, that are just available and allowed more by their schedule this year to do that more than others. Uh, this is going to sort of level the playing field that all the teams are able to provide that that movement to the students, that movement break to the students um, in a more deliberate fashion that's age appropriate for middle school students. Uh, you know, Mike mentioned when we were out there last week seeing students outside taking mass breaks, walking around, throwing a couple balls around, things like that. Um, there's no reason why we can't just integrate that into some of the revisions that are that are happening. Um, next year with, with Best Block and with the, jet, the, the overall master schedule. As far as the drop off and pickup goes, um, it, it really is, um, 
it just makes a lot of sense for us. Um, it's not going to really change a whole lot around the logistics of how we start and end our day. That'll look very similar. It's just that we have more instructional minutes during the day now um, to work in that time into our class periods. So um, I think it gives us a great opportunity at the school to do some things with the schedule that we've been sort of tied tied up for, for a while. Um, and in looking at the, the whole the whole day, um, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity. Here. So um, all in all, we, we've, we've made, a, I'd say, a lot of tweaks um, that add up to a lot of benefits for kids. Tom, Thanks, Tom, I have a question when you're finished. Just just one other point that I would make to the board and then we'll open it right up to questions Thank is you. that uh, the time on bus for middle schoolers in the morning will be about the same. It'll just start earlier and end earlier. High schoolers will be expanded, right? So keep oh, in absolutely. mind that they're, they're going to the middle school and then coming to the high school. So a little more time on bus. Reverse is true in the afternoon. The middle schoolers will be on the bus for a good 15 minutes longer because they will come from the middle school to the high school. Uh, and then high schoolers will have the shorter run in the afternoon. Um, one thing that we should all know is because of the uh, co-curricular activities after school, that fewer high school and middle school students ride the bus in the afternoon. So ridership yeah. is lower in the afternoon just because we have so many students who are engaged with activities at our school. But I, I want to be really <coughs> clear that we're aware that is um, you know, a, a result of this sort of combination of the bus routes. Um, and so just to say it out loud so that everybody's aware that that's what is being proposed. So, question. I have a question. Tom, can you hear me? Yeah. So, uh, if I understand this correctly, best will be by grade level. Correct. So if Brian has math as his best teacher, are you going to rotate through the classes? Like on Monday, he'll have social studies. On Tuesday, he'll have a science. Or is he going to be stuck with the math teacher all the time? Because really to me, that would be a better. The, it, what? Yeah, I, I understand the question. It, it really depends on the student's individual needs. Um, there may be a student who really needs more focus, more remediation in math. Um, sometimes that would come from a regular ed teacher. Sometimes that would come from a specialist. We have, obviously we have our our specialists that are that are able to do dig in more on some of that. So it really depends on the needs of the student. Um, but no, it's not necessarily the case that they're with one teacher, the same teacher, every single day. Why wouldn't it be Tom, the case Tom, then? Can, can, I, can, can I, I just ask can Mary I to explain in? the flexible schedule and module? Because that will help to address the way this will look yeah. different. Yeah. Can you guys all hear me? Yes. Oh, yeah. Do I? <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather not use it if I don't have to. Stop slamming it. We actually just contracted with MBA to add the flex schedule model to our power schools. So specifically for the best block at the middle school and the advisory block at the high school. So um, we have some work this summer to do on figuring out exactly what that looks like, but that's the goal, is that it gives us that flexibility for teachers to off, offer things. So is things. it like the focus I we use in my school, like if Heidi needs help in math, she'll focus, she'll right. go to Brian's math teacher while Brian needs help. Oh, that's Correct. awesome. That's, yes. Nothing against being in one class, but if you're struggling in math and you're in the social studies room all the time, it doesn't help anybody that you're having a movement break and stuck in the social studies room. Do, right. Perfect. Will that oh, that's be, awesome. Will students yep. be able to rotate out in and out of modules that way? Like, if I'm struggling with fractions in math, you know, for one unit or one topic, can I go to, you know, yeah. can I sign up for the math best and then if I'm later struggling with a reading comprehension concept, I then go to the So the my understanding teacher. based on Absolutely. The, the training yeah, it's, is that it's flex grouping like that. Yep. Okay. But Tina, your teacher would probably already schedule you for that. I said, oh, Tina needs help. I'm going to schedule Correct. her in my class. Okay. Correct. So she needs to make up that summative. Right. So basically, she doesn't even know. We, what I've well, heard, I based on the setup of it, is it's easiest to do it almost on a weekly basis. Yes. So the teachers say, okay, Tuesday I'm offering extra help or support on this topic, and I need to see Mike 
yes. and I need to see Tina. Uh, but other kids can then sign up for it if there's space. I love it. I'm offering enrichment during that time, and Liz and Heidi want to sign up for my enrichment. So it gives us a lot more flexibility to be able to not only extend the learning for the kids, mm -hmm. but also to give them that targeted support that they either need, and the teacher's going to say, you need it, mm -hmm. or they want, and they're going to reach out to the teacher. And as a special educator, when kids go in different directions, nobody knows who's going to win class. Nobody knows who's, are the specials going to be wrapped up in this? So per the IEPs, we already have certain supports that take place during the best mm -hmm. block for but certain students. Yeah. And that, that won't change. So yeah. that will be driven by those IEPs and what mm -hmm. their needs are. I'm so the case managers will be providing support during that time. This is a huge improvement over what BEST has been traditionally. I, I think yeah. personalizing what the kids need and giving them what they need during that block is, is just going to make a huge difference. I think that's, I'm really excited about that. And the movement break added in too, I think that will really help with focus and, you know, giving the kids a mental break. They touch base with one teacher a week and then they schedule or they are scheduled and they, it's going to be awesome. Keep, keep in mind that it's new. Yep. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. PD that needs to be yeah. provided yeah. both on using the module and then philosophically right. how to adjust to the new capabilities, mm -hmm. right? right? So, you know, we're going to be rolling this out in the fall, mm -hmm. um, but we'll be providing that PD and then working with our staff to make sure they understand that. We also, I've also, um, and I'm, I'm, I'll steal Tom's thunder here, um, he's reached out, we're trying to put together, he's trying to put together a team to come in this summer and, and work That's out great. some of these logistics as well. That's for great. His, his building. Yep. Yeah. That's great. We also, Tom, uh, Tom, talk about the fifth grade schedule in terms of where best falls in the day. Because, uh, you know, just in examining that, it felt really yeah. like a sweet spot, right? Yeah, so um, we've, we've been looking at, you know, how do we, um, how do we pick up the day for a fifth grader um, who, um, you know, let's be honest, they're fidgety. So um, <laughs> the best block is sort of like middle of the morning like 9 30 10 o'clock ish that time range and then their lunch comes later in the morning like 11 30 11 45 i don't remember exactly um where that's going in but it's in that range so that the morning will be broken up and then the late morning for lunch um slash early afternoon and then you know push them to dismissal with a little couple push-ups between them. The, we'll, we'll we'll have that move the morning so the best block comes at a perfect time uh, for them and then lunch is later in the morning so I got two five questions for you Tom can you describe what a movement break is <laughs> yeah so I mean I, I think it can be a walk it can be going outside giving them I mean we have some field space um, giving them time to um, I mean ball throw a ball around a frisbee around something like that um it, it really can vary from day to day but it's being deliberate about it and just carving that out in the day um every day and, and on a regular basis so that it's just integrated into part of their their daily schedule and for what length you envision that yeah. to be well the best block is is about 45 50 minutes so i would i would say somewhere around 10 to 15 minutes okay so the 90 hours you've gained with your schedule you just not lost half of it well the the best block now is 30 minutes long right tom yeah and and this will be a 50 minute best block and a portion of that will be movement break that Built right. in. Mm -hmm. So the 90 hours we've gained from lengthening the schedule, we've just lost half of it to Well, it, except the minimum standards allow us to count some of this time as part of instructional time. So it's, you know, it's not as generous when it comes to, quote, study hall as it is planned instruction. So if the teachers are guiding this through and are teaching the value of movement, Right? We had a conversation today about how we all have our Apple Watches now that tell us every so often to get up and move. 
you know, so clearly we're understanding that that's a key part of being uh, so of at your best. Can still be so we can count that as instructional time right. if it's planned and purposefully instructed as to why that's being utilized. So it's not lost time, Brian. Right. And then my other question is, will this document be utilized by the um, committee that's looking at start and times of the schools and that process? That, so our goal is, I know this feels like a little bit of a fast rollout, but you know, the next school year is here. We just got our last member of the task force identified late last week. Um, and so now we're gonna begin virtual meetings over the summer because we've run out of time to have in person. Um, and this will be a part of what we look at. There's a whole host, this is the tip of the iceberg, you know, but I think getting the bus routes combined and showing that we can do it in two bus trips around town, um, I think that's the first step and then you know which school should begin first what's the impact on athletics after school there's a lot of deep dive stuff that still needs to come on this the reason i asked is i was talking to a young lady this weekend at soccer and she's from amherst and i'm not sure if you're aware or not but um, amherst has been busting the middle school high school together since when I was <coughs> but i believe starting next year they, they just flip flop their elementary and high school the start times so I don't know how many other high schools, you know, elementary schools are out there doing this, but I mean, of course, we've all seen studies that mm -hmm. it's the older kids who need, you know, to get there a little bit later than earlier. And she well, they all and just described it, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Well, in the school start time task force, there's a link to several schools in New Hampshire that have made this flip, Amherst being one of them. So they were very purposeful in the way they planned that. Um, if the committee can answer all the questions relative to it, um, I think that we can potentially make that flip for a year from this fall. But for right now, this is probably the best we can do on short notice because it's just sort really of that. consolidating what we have. So this will be absolutely used. Absolutely. Yep. And I think it actually gives the um, the task force more to work with mm -hmm. because it's it's a, it's a simpler thing to begin with to sort of then work around so well, because it was all you know a, pe a big piece of the problem as far as the start and end times is mm -hmm. getting more hours into the middle school i think it looks good um because we didn't have the link earlier should we do you need a motion uh, an approval from the board in order to move forward with this or sh should we wait till our next meeting I think I mean, in my opinion, is we wait till the next meeting just in case there's any public input yeah. that may want to take place in, in this setup. Well, and, and that was my next question for the board is, do you want us to put, I mean, we can send this memo, for example. It's pretty clear about what we're proposing. Maybe modify it a little bit for uh, parent uh, mm -hmm. digestion on it, but to get this out to parents now and to let them know what we're yeah. thinking and to Absolutely. ask them if they have yeah. comments, yeah. to get those comments yeah. into us. Yeah. The sooner the better. I will mm -hmm. say I attended the um, fifth grade, the incoming fifth grader parent night and Tom did um, mention that there were gonna be changes to the schedule, that they were tweaking things. So there was already a heads up given to at least that group mm -hmm. um, last week. So they're aware of it. Um, so we'll see. Yeah, I'd love to hear parent feedback. I mean. More perspective and more questions are always beneficial when you're making a big change like this. So I think that's great. We can um, we can actually send a specific Google form out mm -hmm. with the details in there and just asking for comment to be made on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, sure. you know we can ask people if they support the plan or, or you know whatever. So we can we can certainly take that stance on it. Great. So best best currently. Is that considered instructional time or only a portion of it? So it has been considered instructional time. Um, but if you read the standards, it raises a series of questions about there are some students for whom it is clearly instructional time. There are some for whom we say is it instructional time. So we want to address it by so it's more, putting it in place. It will be now more clearly instructional time. Right. This will this will satisfy, I think, the question, especially if we have teachers saying, you know, Johnny, you need to come to me because you need help with math, or Susie saying, I'd like to go to math. Either way, people are picking and choosing the instructional need, and I think it just erases the whole idea. Um, if a kid is sitting quietly in a room working on homework, is that instructional time? Uh, this sort of settles that once and for all in my, in my mind. 
and Mary and I have had a lot of talk about yes. that um, yeah. because Mary is very familiar with the standards also and obviously as the director of curriculum instruction and assessment has to be really on top of that time. Mm -hmm. Great, well thank you for so, that update. I have a question for Corey and I'm sure we already know the answer. Since we're, I know we're using the same amount of buses but now we're on one less route trip. I know we're already in a contract. There wouldn't be any monetary change. <coughs> so what happens to the drivers? Well, they'll be, they'll be working less hours, right? Our, our understanding with first student and speaking to Sean, by the way, they are on board. They think that this is very doable too. They mm -hmm. think it can be done. But when they bid the contract, they promise their drivers two and a half hours of time morning and two and a half hours in the afternoon. So when we next bid a contract, um, we can say we've made these provisions and they could bid a contract that says, okay, we're only gonna guarantee two hours of time morning and afternoon, knowing that they're also, drivers are in short supply and so you know they have to make sure that they're, they're offering a job that's attractive to people. You know, if you shorten it down to something too short, they'll mm -hmm. risk having drivers leap to go to another place. So, um, so those are all the pushes and pulls on it, Brian, but it would have to be in the next contract bid that we would do it because no, they have that guaranteed minimum. consideration, not so much for hours, but they have to pay the drivers. But I'm thinking also we are tearing the vehicles. We've now just reduced the mileage. Exactly. You've reduced by a third the mileage and wear and tear on the vehicles mm -hmm. and fuel costs. So they're getting a savings. I'm just wondering if we can do a sidebar with them. Well, we own the buses, so you it know, would be... The fuel yeah. is worth. Yeah, maybe on the fuel at mm -hmm. least. Yeah, let yeah, us absolutely. let us pursue because I, I understand the commitment they've made to their workforce, yeah. but mm -hmm. the fuel piece is is a different. Do we pay so. a flat year long? I mean, in the contract, do we pay per gallon or do we pay for the year? It's all within the price. I don't think we don't pay a fuel surcharge or anything to okay. them. It's all set. It's all set. Daily okay. rate. Um, I do believe that we kept like a year end meeting with them. So we okay. Can bring some is that just a pass-through, or are they marking it out? Because if it's just a pass-through, it'll just be a reduction. I, you sound like you're talking about negotiating that down, but is it just a pass-through? Is it what we, yeah, it's, do we the pay for what, what we use, or do we pay? We just pay the daily rate. I see. I, yeah, I don't think, so it's a great question. I mean, mm -hmm. gas yes. was 2.29 a gallon, and that was right. 3.89 a gallon. Um, and so I just don't know that how all those daily fluctuations are factored into this, but I think all of it helps us in our next negotiation, which when do we start with them? This one goes through 24. Okay. Well, it may even help us in this year. If it's just a daily rate that's whatever they're pumping into the buses each day, we get mm -hmm. charged that, then we'll just naturally get charged less. But and any time, any time I've approached them for any type of discussion, addendum, anything, they've been open to it. Mm -hmm. So good. Good they're pretty good to work with. Sure, the first thing they'll show you is that diesel fuel was two dollars when we signed the contract. Right. Now it's three dollars. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Well, they so, must be tracking for that so too. Even the though cost. the price is going up, we're still saving them a third of the fuel. Mm -hmm. All right. Anything else about the LMS schedule and planning the bus routes? All right, do you have any more comments? I am set. Do we need Tom for anything further? Is he? No. I don't think so. Tom, I think you're welcome to stay, and you, you don't need to, so it's your call. <laughs> Thank you all. Thanks, Thank Tom. Thanks, Tom. Uh, school board comments. Um, I have a few comments. I would like to just congratulate the class of 2021 um, who graduated last Friday. Um, it was a wonderful, perfect, if a little rainy, ceremony. Um, I'm, I'm just, I, I think I speak for the board and our community when we say we're just so proud of our, their accomplishments and look forward to hearing about all the great things that you are up to in the world um, in, the, in the coming years. And a big thank you for, um, to LCTV for making sure that we had ample audio. Everything sounded crystal clear and was great out in the field. Um, and for recording and streaming the ceremony, I think it was um, well received. So thank you for that. Any other school board comments? 
Yep. Um, I'll, I'll stay on the sports part of it. I'd like to give a big shout out to the girls' softball team from mm -hmm. CHS for mm -hmm. being state champs and undefeated. That's an awesome job. These young ladies have been playing, as you I'm sure you read from Rich, He's very proud of his uh, niece. Granddaughter. Granddaughter, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, uh, these young ladies, a lot of them have been playing together for like eight, ten years, right seven years, years all yeah. together. And, uh, it's amazing. I think they knew in the beginning of the year that they were stacked and they were going. So <laughs> congratulations to them. That's great. And also just a shout out to the girls lacrosse team who played in their first playoff game since they were uh, developed here at the high school. And congratulations to the boys too who did very yeah. well in lacrosse. Mm -hmm. So one thing for certain, the athletes um, in this district show very well in different tournaments. Um, I know the arts also had their uh, performances, but I'm mistaken that uh, I hear is, were exceptional. So congratulations to them also. I want to thank Campbell High School for putting on a wonderful graduation ceremony and a shout out to all those kids that didn't get accolades or recognition that were resilient and fought through it and got their diploma. I'm very proud of each and every one of you. So one thing on the graduation, because I noticed Tom sent his out um, as far as uh, how it's gonna be. I, and I know that in the, because he doesn't rent chairs. I like the idea, like, you bring your own chair. You know, now that you mention that, I really, oh, this is so funny, I feel like I'm at a family dinner. Yeah. It's very lit. <laughs> it's it's, it's more pot, like high school lunch. The yeah. pod situation, I think, works whether we're in a pandemic or not. Yeah. And the fact that my family, we weren't in the front, we weren't in the back, we were kind of tucked in the middle, but my little pod of people had a good seat and nobody rushed there at four o'clock to mm, put down yeah, programs nice. and someone's great uncle's brother's sister isn't yeah. in the front row while I'm in the mm. way back. Yeah. I really like that idea of pods for families and maybe excess people BYOT in the back or C. I, re I really like the whole pod thing. So we had rented the chairs for the event, um, but they had to get returned that night. So in talking with Tom about what he was going to do, we went with the bring your own chair. Everybody has those chairs in their car yes, for sporting mm -hmm. events or whatever. So, and then it just simplifies it. Mm -hmm. uh, People do the labor of setup, the labor of takedown, mm -hmm. and they have something that's a little bit more comfortable than those plastic mm -hmm. rented chairs, mm -hmm. right? So it just felt like a, a better way to go. So our first time testing it out will be um, for the middle school event. And if it goes well, we may consider incorporating it. It'll be less expensive in the long run. Cooler in every way, shape, and form. Mm -hmm. We could lose five pounds every one of those graduations in that auditorium. <laughs> Oh, oh the in the gym? School? That oh, was like chair. a sweatshop. Yeah, yeah and j just a reminder that not only is it hot in the middle school gym, um, it's a complete uh, emergency uh, conflict because wow. there's, there, there are cars stacked up and down yeah. oh, both and sides. Oh, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it simply is unsafe, mm -hmm. and so we had to make the move over to the high school. Outdoors on the field is the best route. The weather forecast is fine this year, but if we had to come in, we've got this auditorium, which is also a better uh, environment, I think. So or the gym. I think that the high school usually does it in the gym if they have to be inside. There you go. With a feed into here. <coughs> Great. Any other school board comments? No. All right. That brings us to the public minutes from June 2nd, 2021. I'll make a motion to approve the June 2nd, 2021 draft mm -hmm. min or approve the minutes. Good second. <laughs> Any questions or comments or changes? All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? P minutes approved, um, 500. And now we have a curriculum report from <coughs> Mary Whitman. I will be very careful with the microphone. <laughs> I do have to put my computer down, though. I'm sorry. Okay. Good evening. Hi, hello. I feel very formal. <laughs> the panel is here. To be too. speaking to this <laughs> large crowd. Um, just a little update on um, the monthly update on curriculum instruction and assessment. Uh, professional learning, we do have Live to Learn coming up next week. Very excited that we have 43 staff 
Um, and that may have fluctuated a little bit. I've gotten emails over the last couple of days like, oh, can you add me? Can you put me in here? So, um, but we have over 40 staff members that are participating this year. That's right around the same as when we did it two years ago, which considering the level of exhaustion at this point in the year after what we've gone through for the last year and a half, um, that's, I, I'm, that's very exciting to me. Um, all of our tech sessions, most of our tech sessions are going to be run by staff. So I, I'm, I'm really excited that we're able to kind of transition that. Um, it takes a little bit of the pressure off of Jason while he's trying to do some other things, but it also is one of my goals for the PD committee and for our, as we're developing PD for the district is to have more opportunities for teacher led PD. Um, and as the curriculum director, I will say that I'm super excited that there are um, over 20 different teachers that have signed up to do some sort of curriculum work. The majority of them looking to work on assessments and rubrics, which is right in line with what we're going to talk about a little bit later. Um, I'm going to skip over grading because we're going to talk a lot more about that. Um, I gave you the park update at the last meeting. Um, and just a couple other things on assessment and data. We did, um, the high school did get together common summative assessments. Um, they were created, they were submitted to the building admin. And um, Bill and I have been trying to find some time to meet and get some feedback so that we can help guide the revision of them or the implementation of them. Um, the other big thing is the uh, SAS data has just started to, um, I mean, now that we've finished the testing, we have access to the, step, to the SAS data, the preliminary data, we've started to review it. Mike and I have looked at it. We've looked at it very briefly with the building admin. Um, we will be doing that more during the admin retreat that is during Live to Learn. And um, reports are coming out in the next two weeks. What grades, is, what grades are that? It is three through eight. Okay. And they tested on grade level, not the year Correct. before. Correct. Okay. This, they cur this was regular testing right. on grade level, um, math and ELA, and that's all grade levels three through eight, and then science is three, eight, and 11. So those reports will be coming out in the next two weeks and they will be mailed home by the buildings. In the future, just as a side, um, I, I was in a meeting today where they talked about um, now that the state has taken this on, it will be um, portal-based moving forward after July 1, so for next year. Okay, and that brings us to, I do have an update on grading and reporting. Um, the presentation is linked. So I, I don't, I'm like, it's not, I'm expecting it to be there. It's not there, that's on me. Um, so grading and reporting moving forward, just to give you guys a little bit of an update. Um, we started our year with some difficulties around grading and reporting. As I think it was the last time I was presenting in the auditorium. <laughs> um, but just to, to kind of refresh our memory and let you know where we are. Um, I wanted to start with the purpose of grade reporting. And this is actually a statement that, with a little tweaking, predates me. This was the purpose that was written by our grading and reporting committee um, when I came on board. This was one thing that they had already, they had adopted it. We tweaked the language a little bit this spring just to reflect the competency language a little bit more to align with what we are using in terms of like proficiency and development. So the purpose of grade reporting is to provide feedback to students and families regarding the student's proficiency to date and areas for continued growth and development. Okay, so that is an agreed upon by our district grading and reporting committee purpose for grade reporting. All right, the vision. So this is really where I'd like to see us go in the vision for the next three to five years. So I have four, four goals with um, really the why. I wanted to add that piece, because we've talked about a five, three to five year vision before. 
Um, but I really felt it was important to add the why. So summatives truly assess the application of content and skills or the competencies and standards. Why? The students need to be able to have opportunities to demonstrate skills in individualized and varied ways. We need to really focus on challenging them to analyze, evaluate, and create, and not just recall and remember. My next goal is to, or our next goal, is to have the summatives graded on a four-point scale using a rubric that is consistent by course. To have them be graded on competency-based rubrics that we develop as departments, as co um, groups that are teaching the same courses. And really, that's because we want students to be able to see their progress and growth towards mastery and to really understand what their scores mean. The descriptors on a rubric mean more than just saying, oh, I got a 95. Well, what does that mean? It means I got a 95. It doesn't allow the students or the teachers or the parents to see areas of growth or areas where they are, are excelling. And, and really, a big part of our conversation, and it's right there on the slide, is we need to shift the focus from earning to learning. You know, that has to be the mentality. And, and, and this is a, a huge culture shift because it's the kids, the staff, the parents, the community, we've all grown up in that idea of, you know, what did I get? How are you doing in science? I have an 85. You know, it, if we can shift it to, I'm really struggling with the scientific method, that's gonna help open up our conversations a lot more and get our kids more engaged in their own learning. So we need to provide more voice and choice and individualized pathways for students. Uh, we know that every student learns in a different way and that idea of one size fits one is how we need to, what we need to keep in mind as we are instructing and assessing. Um, you know, I, I made the statement, if we keep them all in the same box, we're failing them. Mm -hmm. And um, that's, that's the easy way to do it. And for many of us, that's how we were taught, but it's not what is best for kids. And the last piece is consistency and commonality on how we grade and assess. This comes back to the idea of competency-based assessments that are developed within departments or with across courses. Um, and also using our PLC time to workshop assessments and to norm our grading. And that's really the important piece. That's why this isn't gonna happen tomorrow. This is a long-term you know, a long term plan because that takes time. But we need to be able to have the time built in with our PLC work to, to bring assessments forward and have the teachers score them blindly and say, why did you give it this? Why did you give it this? It's got the same rubric. How are we, why, why is it different? And really get us all on the same page. So that is how we see us moving forward. I think it's very much aligned to the goals that we've put out that have been put out by the school board and um, so I think we're doing the right thing but this is our current situation currently power school is set up to give equal weight to all the competencies that formatives don't count the grades are based on summatives that summatives automatically calculate to a percentage. This is a whole lot, but this is how we have the whole thing set up. So basically at the end of the quarter, all the summatives in a competency get averaged together and that's the competency grade. Those competency scores get averaged together to make the final grade for the course. Equal weight for all summatives, equal weight for all competencies, okay? In a system like power school, let me finish. I know, I'm biting my tongue, it's bleeding. <laughs> uh, typically when you talk competencies, you don't talk averaging, mm -hmm. but with a system like power school, it, while we are still trying to live in that world of a hundred point scale and you know, competencies, that's, that's the way we have to do it. That's not how we are doing it. So I said, I knew I was going to get there. Um, we have a large majority of our staff that are doing that. They're doing just that. They're doing what we've, what we've, how we've set it up. Um, it's also new. 
Remember, competency-based grading and reporting on it is new to our elementary and our middle school. Um, but we also have staff that have tried to figure out an end around. They don't like it. They want weighted points, as you'll see. We have staff that want the ability to, to weight individual assignments or to categorize everything on points, to allow for smaller formative assessments to count and have an impact on student grades. Uh, they want to be able to have greater value for things that they believe require more time, more effort, and are more complex. And what we've seen is these are vocal things that have come up in our grading and reporting committee and publicly and in conversations across, across the buildings. But we've seen staff try and end around to get there through how we've had our grading system set up. And that's where we have a problem. So just to clarify, so this, so what you're talking about are, I think, is when you go in power school, like as a parent, and you mm -hmm. can see summative, like there's one class that has all their summatives are 100 points. Mm -hmm. and some are so that's the former that you were talking about. But what you're talking about now are some summatives that maybe are worth 200 points yes. or worth 50. Those are the ones or you're talking about. That's how they're trying. Four. That's how they're trying to weight them. So themselves. even if they're weighted, so I can put my grades in and have a, out of 35 points but it's gonna to calculate to a percentage, okay? What, no matter what, whether I put it in out of 100 points or out of 35 points. But what's happening is we're grouping smaller things. We're, we're just finding end around. So you might see, you might go in and see a five point assessment, a 10 point assessment, yes, that's what a I 15 see. point assessment, and then all of a sudden a they're right marked as formative and you see a 500 point assessment. Um, they can, everything can't be a summative. It doesn't make sense. They're not, that, that's where we're getting stuck and we have to be consistent. Be consistent. That's Correct. What, as a parent of looking at 17 point summative, 500 point summative, there's no consistency. And we all know where I stand on this and I'm not on the, oh, sorry. But I want it consistent. No matter what you all decide on, it needs to be consistent. Which is, which is where, if you look back to what, what the goal is, is that all summatives will be on that four-point scale. If we have all summatives graded on that rubric. So EE4 will, will be exceptional, meeting, meeting expectations. Yeah. yeah. That if it's all graded on a four point rubric that articulates this is the competency, this is what the expectations are for that competency, then we don't have that. If, if you can't grade it on that, then it shouldn't be a summative. I think it gets back to the earning versus learning like you talked about. I think we're so, we're so used to our kids earning a number or a letter grade on an assignment. Mm -hmm. But how can we do this if the assignments are still earning not learning well, that's where we're trying that's, that's so trying. it's it's we a huge overhaul and there have to be right. enough summatives to fairly correct well so you can count all your assignments as form summatives if you want so the bottom line um is as a grading and reporting committee i took the stance that that was what needed to happen and we, as a committee, were completely unable to come to consensus. That's what happened in my district. So we are in consensus with two of our buildings and not with one. So this is where we're at. This is why I'm here. This is, I wanna address some of the things that have come up in the meetings, as well as in some surveys that were shared with me as well as um, what I would like to see us do moving forward. So these are some of our current challenges and some proposed solutions. There's a million more solutions. But it needs to be consistent. Math can't grade different from English and different from, okay, I'm done. Right. We just have to be able to, we have to be able to, it, how it's set up right now, Liz, mm -hmm. everybody should be grading the same way and it doesn't matter it doesn't matter if that's 25 points or 50 points because it should calculate to a percentage. What about 
parents, I kind of have a window into this. What about parents that have no idea what's going on? It's hard to explain. It, it shouldn't be for our teachers. Yeah. It shouldn't be hard for the teachers to explain it. The problem is we don't have a consistent explanation. And that came across loud and clear because the very first thing that we did in grading and reporting was try and write an elevator speech for what does our grading mm -hmm. look like. And it's all over the place. I mean, Tara, you know you've been part of those meetings. Um, it's all over the place. In the we, airplane? Yeah. Um, so just I want to address a few questions that have come up. And they come up all the time. So the big one, if formatives don't count, the kids won't do them. OK? So the things that, these are the conversations that I have when, when this comes up. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about ways to combat it. So my first question to teachers is always, well, why aren't they doing it? Is the work meaningful? If you're giving kids work just to have them do work, they're not going to do it. We won't do it as adults. So is it meaningful? Does it tie to what's going on in class? And this is, a, this is one that we have a hard time with, but do they need the practice? Or have they already, are they already mastered the competency? If they've already mastered it, of course they're not going to do it. They don't need it. So what do we do? If a student's doing well on the summative, it's time for us to think about whether or not they needed to do that formative work. If they didn't do well on the summative, then make the completion of the formative work part of the condition of a reassessment. And the other piece is to track the formatives in power school so that the data is right there and you can have that discussion with parents and you have the data to support the scoring of work study practices. We have to shift the work study practices from a mentality of, oh, it's just like an effort grade to what it truly is. We worked really hard to build rubrics and to articulate what it really is, but I'm not sure that we are consistently even doing that. Um, so other concern, if kids know they can reassess, they don't try the first time. So my question, how do you know they didn't try the first time? And the typical response is, well, because the very first thing they said was, are we going to be able to reassess? I get it. But we also have to think about what else is going on in that kid's life and how frequently is it happening? If it's happening all the time, that's a bigger issue and a bigger conversation. If it just happens once, you know, why? So the big thing that we have to do is we have to stop assuming that because a kid asks about it that they're not prepared. I know a lot of kids that have test anxiety and just knowing that they have an opportunity to reassess is going to calm them down enough to be able to take it and to do well on it. That's been going on well before this. Of course, of course. Um, the other piece is to make a reassessment plan with the student that is individualized to their needs and put the responsibility back on the kid. I hear all the time it's more work for teachers. Yeah, it might be at first, but once the kids realize, if you have those kids that just aren't trying, once they realize how much work goes into having to do a reassessment, they're not gonna do that again. The kids that are gonna take advantage of it are the kids that really need that extra work. Um, and the other thing is to look at how student, a student learns to see if the format of the assessment may have been what they struggled with and not the actual application. You know, as a former Spanish teacher, if I'm testing on reading, but the kid had a hard time articulating their answers, doesn't necessarily mean that they didn't understand the reading. It's just that they couldn't articulate their Spanish answers. That's where you have to be careful when you are depending on what you are looking at. Uh, so some of my summatives are more complex and should be valued more. Questions to ask yourself, are they demonstrating proficiency in the competencies in both assessments? Because if it's, they did it, it was a homework, they answered questions, is that truly getting at competency or is it just work completion? Uh, 
big question is, is the complexity around the depth of knowledge, that's DOK, I meant to put that in there, I'm sorry, uh, or is it effort? I hear a lot, well, that takes kids so long. But is the task more complex or does it just take them longer? If we're looking at competencies, it's the complexity, irregardless of the time it takes. And when we're looking at smaller tasks, could they be part of a larger performance assessment? Could you take a bunch of those smaller tasks and link them into a larger assessment. So if the more complex tasks include depth of knowledge three or four and the smaller one doesn't, move the smaller one of the formative category or build it into a more comprehensive performance assessment. Make sure, and this is, this is where I think we get hung up and, and, and you know, she's not here, but Liz's concern, we have scores going in that are completion grades that are, you know, it's a good kid. He did most of it right. I'm gonna give him an 85. But are they really demonstrating competency? That is what we have to ask ourselves. And then make sure that the complex task isn't just more complex because it takes longer. And the biggest one, we've been grading like this forever. Everyone understands it. Why are we changing now? So my questions are these. What's the actual under, level of understanding on competency-based grading? Because I know that, at least in this building, we've been doing competency-based grading since they opened in 2001. What is the actual level of understanding? What do our current grades tell us and tell the kids about what they're learning? Again, it goes back to that learning versus earning. And is what we are currently doing, are our practices truly competency-based? Uh, I mean, these are kind of gut check questions, but they're questions that we have to start getting people to think about. Um, what, what can we do? Take a look at what we're, why we are talking about changing. We have people in all three buildings who get this, who are doing it, we saw them at the last board meeting. Um, they are, they're taking the bull by the horns and they're doing it on their own. And that's just an example. So we have to start to, to give them opportunities to, to be the voice and make them feel comfortable being the voice. Um, there's a ton of philosophy and best practices around grading. That's important that we get people that aren't on board or that don't understand it to start to, to do some of that PD. Um, and again, take a deep dive into your own practices to see if you're focused on true learning or great earning. I know saying these things does not make me, are, are, isn't gonna earn me a lot of points publicly, but the reality is if we are going to say we're truly competency-based, then we need to start paying attention to these things. All right, my action steps, what I would like to see us do moving forward. One of the big things is I think we have to review our current grading policies and practices. Um, that is where I, I'm looking for the board to help um, for, with input and revision as we, as we look at those. Um, we currently do not have an articulated grading policy. We have practices that I believe are articulated in the different handbooks but we do not have a policy. Um, and some of our linked policies need to be revised, our homework policy, our competency assessment policy. Um, so I'd like to do some work this summer on getting those revised to support the work that we need to do, and that's really where I'm gonna need some support from the board. Um, next year, we will keep the grade set up the same. Um, it's going to be a lot of conversation about the fact that we have to do it the right way. We have to work on the consistency, and that's going to be through administrative meetings, and that's the message that has to come from the buildings. Um, but we have a lot of people coming in to work on rubrics this summer and to work on assessments. So I really have a focus on the summer PD time and the upcoming PLC time 
to build both the competency summatives and competency rubrics so that we are in a better place coming into the following school year. Um, and the other piece is we, we do have to continue to build capacity in what our best practices in competency ed, book studies. Uh, I can start doing monthly check-in at staff meetings with teams and department leaders, um, start doing some more open forums for discussion. You know, that's, those are just some thoughts that I've had that might help. Um, and just attached to the end of that, you'll see there are um, three really big names in grading policy, in grading philosophy. Um, so I have a couple links to some resources there. Um, I have all of them in my office if anybody's interested in reading them. Um, it links just to the Amazon so you can read a little bit about them. But, um, you know, On Your Mark by Gusky. Uh, Grading Smarter Not Harder by Dweck, and Fair Isn't Always Equal by Wormelli. Those are three of the biggest names in grading for all kids. And then I do have some resources linked in there as well. Um, again, I have those all in my office as well, if anybody would like to check them out, um, on competency-based education in general. All of these do address grading and they address a lot of the things that we've talked about. That is a lot. I've done a lot of talking and I apologize that you had to listen to all of it. <laughs> I appreciate it. I mean, I think when, when the board, you know, when, when we hired Dr. Jetty, this was one of the things that we identified that needed to be basically repaired. And where we need to go and I think the board shares that vision um, my question though too is as we as we make these changes I want to be sure that we're not leaving parents mm -hmm. behind and that we're you know that when they get the reports you know the grade right. the grades and the report card that it um, that the philosophy behind why we're doing what we're doing and you know the information was informative was summative that that is all going out and working to educate parents as yes. well because you know we can communicate out to them as much as possible but if they don't understand what they're reading then we fail them right <coughs> right which is part of the the reason that you know when I come to the board I try and do and actually Mike had to rein me in a little bit on this <laughs> presentation because I started getting into the weeds um, but I, I always try and make sure that we have these posted as well um, and that, I mean that's just one thing yeah. But I do know that we've um, we talk at length about how do we how as we're making these changes, how are we communicating it to parents as well? Thank you. One thing I'd just like to emphasize, and it's really about the, the use of time with staff. So at the high school and the middle school next year, the purposeful use of PLC time is just becoming part of the daily design. So. It's aligned in such a way that Mary is able to support the teachers with that. Um, and the same thing at the middle school. You haven't seen the actual schedule yet, but uh, Tom is going to be better be able to support the team mm -hmm. with the PLC time that's embedded. And um, we had made a visit to a school in Massachusetts. We left there very energized. We haven't designed exactly how to form a partnership, but I will tell you, it's a school that's walking this Right. Yeah, they, and has been for 26 20 years. something years. They, so they were founded at about the same time as Campbell, um, and they have a, uh, a transcript that is not based on grades, and so it's a competency-based transcript. So they've been doing it, and very successfully. So we're going to continue to get our staff members out. Our plan is to uh, design some PD yep. for them. Um, they are all designed around PLC time and how they collaboratively support each other. So we think that's a key aspect of how we want to use that relationship. And certainly at the high school, it, it answers a lot of the questions about how to report on this for students. So very energized by these things, and I think we're headed in the right direction and pulling it together. 
But Mike, can I add something to that? Absolutely. Bill is still I with I us. I didn't know that Bill's with us. <laughs> He's kind of scared me. Uh, he, he's everywhere. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, so I, I just wanted to touch base on what you were saying with respect to the teachers and their professional time. If you look up within our social studies department, they've done an incredible job this year in terms of the competencies, in terms of the curriculum, and I think they're sort of the, the shining star out there that we're looking at and seeing, okay, the opportunities there. Math has done the same thing. I also think, though, that. Um, that with Andrea Stern, we've been able to give the CFs a shared block together, which is the department chairs, and the unified arts coordinator a shared time together, which provides Mary that constant communication yep. that will be available to make sure that not only are they hearing it from me, but they're hearing it from Mary, and then they're bringing it back to their, their departments. Um, I also think that when you look at three schools, you know, two of which are just getting on board, in Campbell, who was said we were doing this forever, um, we're at different degrees on that timeline, and even within departments at Campbell, we're in different degrees of, of sort of where we need to be. So I think pulling that all together, um, Mary's got us going in the right direction. Now everybody's got to start pulling in the oars on all three schools. And that's, I think that's where we're headed over the next couple of years. I have no doubt about that. Great. It's good to hear. Yeah, absolutely. The two schools that are in agreement I mean, is it possible for them to move forward with, are, there, are they already moving forward with how we're, so, our, our, our end goal? Do you know what I mean? Like, I, I just think about, you know, do I trust the grades that, that were given to my kids this year? You know, and I think that, that's a parent, parents are going to ask that question. They're going to ask it next year, too, if, we're, if we've identified this issue and we're not at least, I mean, I know we're moving toward it, but to wait a whole other year before so what implementing. We, we're, what we are implementing right now is a structured competency system. That's what, it, when you look at what, how we are set up, that is what's in place. That is how teachers have been trained to input grades. And for the buildings that are ready and moving forward with this and Many, many teachers in the buildings that are not, they're doing it the right way, or they're doing it the way we have it set up. It's those few outliers who are stuck on how things have been, they want everything to count, and that is where we have people that have come up with workarounds to it. And that's something that we have to address with those specific people. That's the reality. Uh, last year, we said we'd give them flexibility. When, we, when I sat here in September or October we, and, and it blew up, we said we'd give them flexibility for this year so long as we had representation on, um, you know, on the committee. And the reality is we have just hit an impasse. And the last two meetings have been derailed to a certain degree um, and we're, we're rehashing the same thing that we were rehashing in September so yeah and that's, and that's got to stop yeah I, I was just going to really say does. at yeah. what point do you say this is the train the train is moving you need to be on this train. well in all honesty I mean Tara you you've been at some of our meetings the second to last meeting that's what I said yeah and um it did not go over well. Not surprised, but I think in oh, order. But it, it, if it just doesn't go over well, but we say we're gonna continue moving forward yeah. like that, um, then at that next meeting, at that last meeting, all of the bringing us back to the things that they wanted to be doing mm -hmm. would not have happened. Right. Instead, it became, this is top down, you're telling me I have to do it this way. Well, yes, because that's a competency-based system. Mm -hmm. um, I, but I think the, the other thing, too, that is kind of diagnosed is the why. So I do believe with the PLCs intact and the opportunity for ongoing support and dialogue, it will help some of the teachers. So mm -hmm. you know, some of it is, yeah. I really can't wrap my head around it. And, mm -hmm. it. and it can't just become a, well, think about it over the next month have right. another meeting. Right. It needs to be a daily, here's, here's the 
disconnect, I guess, between practice and philosophy and Correct. opportunity. To, and, and really, for Mary to be able to support, Bill to be able to support, the CFs to be able to support, that is just critical Correct. time to embed in. That time is going to be huge to be able to, to, for me to be able to meet regularly with the CFs mm -hmm. um, and then have the opportunity to, as needed, go to PLC time and support the CFs in disseminating that to their curriculum facilitators. Yes. Okay, just check. Sorry. You know, I, I know when I go in to look at a teacher grade book and every assignment given to a child is a summative, <laughs> that's a complete disconnect with what we're talking about, right? Is that on so purpose or because they don't know? It, well, that's a piece that we have to say that's yeah, not acceptable and here's the yeah. way to come at it differently. Right. You know, using the analogy of the driver's test. So there's that independent third party that your kid is gonna get in a car alone with and they're gonna decide whether they have all the skills and competencies to get a license, right? But as a parent, you're the one coaching them all along when they're bumping into the curb, slow and going at a stop Are sign. you talking to me specifically? No, I'm oh, talking to yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> you're kidding. <laughs> you know, and, but you're the one teaching the kid how to do all those pieces, right? right? And so here's what we have to get our teachers to realize is all those little teaching moments that occur along the way mm -hmm. don't have to be graded as summatives. They're not a bunch right. of independent summatives. Right. What matters is that independent third party um, and the big high, higher stakes. I mean, it is a higher stakes thing, right? The stranger gets in your car, you never met him before, you may never see him again, but they're gonna determine if you mm -hmm. meet the standard. And so that's the piece that I think we have to get ourselves right. is, accustomed to. Is there maybe a mentorship program that we could arrange with that, that school that you were just talking about. Because I think in some ways, you know, to have somebody outside of our school system might really be beneficial and perhaps influential or teaching it to the teachers in a different way, perhaps. You know, I yeah. just think that that I, disconnect I think might help that's actually the partnership, connect that. Right. That's the partnership we're trying to form with this other school okay. because I'm telling you, there wasn't, and I promised the principals, didn't I, Bill, that I was not going to talk about it until after school true. ended. Um, and here I am talking <laughs> about it already. But I just Which is why to, it's not my presentation. And I wanted them to wrap it up. But I, I'm very energized by exactly that, Tara, mm -hmm. that they will be able to provide that ongoing PD and either coming here. Mm -hmm. I mean, the school is a, mm -hmm. an easy drive, easy commute. Um, and so we can send staff there and bring people here. Yeah. It really is a great opportunity. I think for that's it. a good point because when you think of it, you know, some of these teachers who are reluctant to to change their philosophy and, and the why don't know, maybe, you know, they have a different why than we have. Correct. Um, they're somewhat isolated. You know, there's one high school in our district. Right. They don't have colleagues in our district that have the same, you know, that are doing mm -hmm. it differently at the other high schools or the other schools. Um, and, so and matching the other, them up with somebody who can kind of support them through that, I think is important. The other piece that's a struggle is you, you know, the state of New Hampshire required that, requires that all schools report out on competencies. Mm -hmm. And every school does it differently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And even, you know, the ones that claim to be doing it right, there are parts of that that when you look behind the curtain might not be right. And there's others that are saying, no, we don't really do it, but they're really doing a great job with it. And it's, it's, it's hard because it's a small state, teachers talk to one another, and so when it's, well, yeah, we pushed back enough, and so it didn't change in our community, um, mm -hmm. you hear that, you hear that. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes, well, if we hold on long enough, they'll go away. Well, but it, it's not going away. And it speaks to what happened 20 years ago when the school opened right. and was competency-based. Correct. The community pushed back. Correct. So they, you know, it became a hybrid. But we're in a much, the state itself is in a much different yeah. place. The, the, the training, the understanding, the, the opportunities that are out there, um, and the research that's out there is in a much different place. Mm -hmm. We just need to educate those that are willing mm -hmm. and those that are not willing, we, we need to figure out how to help them mm -hmm. onto something, whether it's with us or somewhere else. Can I ask a, a question that may or may not be related? I'm not 100% sure. 
This year at LMS, the grading changed such that instead of being having your grade start over again at the beginning of the quarter, it, it it's cumulative. Yeah. Correct, it rolls. Yes. Is that something we're going to be continuing? Is that tied to competency-based yes. grading and how? So our competencies are year-long competencies. So we have, for example, math has two competencies, yep. right? They're the same all year, but what gets more difficult and more complex is the the, the skills underneath right. it. And they all kind of cycle back and forth. Um, that should be, like, you're going to have, in a true competency-based system, you're going to have kids that will come in and they can't do the basic stuff. But as they develop over time, by the end, we're hoping that not only can they get the basics, but they can get the more complex. Yeah. As opposed to saying, you failed first quarter because you didn't get it. You failed second quarter because you didn't get it. Oh, you passed third quarter barely because you're starting to get it. You aced fourth quarter, but you failed for the year because. Right. The, and that's the whole philosophy behind it. Mm -hmm. um, in all honesty, that was a change we made at the high school. Mm -hmm. um, and Tom felt very strongly that, that he wanted the middle school to mirror that. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it, I wasn't pushing that right out of the gate because it was such a big change. But ideally, that is, that's how it should be to progress through the year. But students can also reassess their summatives if their formatives are done. They get one. What do you mean they get one? So you can redo one summative if you have completed all of your formatives just one per, per quarter. quarter that doesn't sound like again um we've there were two things we were supposed to get done this year oh I, i'm one I'm, no, 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 no no that isn't um, the way we, i the understand. number two it's not no it's okay. not um but we are in very different places with our relearning oh absolutely and that because of what kind of happened this year with the whole power school mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. setup and the points, weighted points, non-weighted points, all of that, um, it derailed us. We had very little conversation about trying to move forward with the relearning plan. I just think, you know, again, I think you guys are doing a great job. I, I do think there needs to be more parent refreshers with respect to the cumulative grade, how that ties into competency based on why it's important because I think there were some kids that struggled first quarter mm -hmm. that were remote learners, and then they went back into school January 8th, but they could not dig themselves out. out of that hole enough mm -hmm. to do well. And I think the parents, I know some parents that didn't even know that it was cumulative and just assumed that they would be fine, mm -hmm. and it, it didn't go that way. And okay. so I think the more um, education the parents can have on how that works and why. And again, to me, it seems like having a good start first quarter sets the tone, Absolutely. honestly, because if you start out, you know, with 70s, yes, you can get it back up and that's great. Or I guess we're not using 70s with two. But we are, we are. I mean, in, in but right. reality, we are. But could we have, like, at the beginning of the year, when, uh, like a parent explanation of what this is? Because here are two parents that don't understand the cumulative, and I'm not pointing fingers, I'm, it's Absolutely, new. absolutely. And, and it's done differently in every district, I the, think. The reality is that when I came to the first board meeting to do that, that was my goal. We just, I knew it got, mm -hmm. was gonna get derailed before it even got here. It's a new year um, in September. Right, new so year. in September, absolutely, we will have a lot of this. I, I hope that we will have made some significant progress um, over the summer to a point where a lot of the other pieces mm -hmm. that right now are kind of up in the air will have. Yeah. Right, and I think you're starting from a better mm -hmm. place in the sense that parents are now familiar with power school. And so that mm -hmm. was a shift mm -hmm. too, Correct. shifting to it power school and trying right. to learn that. Correct. Plus all of a sudden cumulative based grading where it's going, you know, it's right. lasting in competency based. And it, I think all of those changes at mm -hmm. once in a school year that was already incredibly right. pressured. Story, yeah. It was yeah. difficult Absolutely. for Absolutely. parents to understand, and I think some still didn't understand mm -hmm. until even recently. Well, so. even kids, oh, I bombed first semester, first quarter, I can bring it, yeah. I think too, like in order, before we can, before we can give parents an, a, you know, an accurate picture of how this works, we have to get it working. 
Yes. <laughs> you know, so, yes. Yes. You know, we don't want to say this is how this is what this means, and this is when it's still very different from department to department, teacher to teacher, school to school. Right. So I I just would, I mean at the high school it may work fine at the high school because at the high school is semester, right? I some, mean some classes are year long, some are semester. Yep, summer semester. Well, I had I mean it's just. You get to third quarter, it's literally impossible to dig yourself out of that hole if you're if you're struggling at the at the beginning of third quarter, and that is my big concern. But is the but, but that's I mean I think that goes back to the earning versus learning because are you digging yourself out of a hole because of the grades you've earned or because you haven't learned the material? You know what I mean? Like if you're not demonstrating competency at the end of second quarter, that should be okay as long as you're getting support the support you need to, to master it. those competencies. Right. And the here. other piece is it goes back to when you saw the grade, it, back to the slide that has... I don't mean to pick on you, Tara. Um, no. Our current situation, the very last bullet on how we're currently set up is, a really, is probably the most important bullet but I will tell you it's the piece that we are the least comfortable with. Because in a true competency system, again, you earn over time and you look at kids' growth. So that kid that isn't doing so well at the beginning, but by fourth quarter is getting everything, like has mastered all of it and has, a, you know, masters the summative competency assessment we should not be looking at, we should be looking at the trends in the grades and not quarter by quarter. Which is important and I absolutely agree with that, but I think again, the mentality is, I want my kid to have honor roll and high honor roll and they're not gonna have a B average or whatever you need to have, the B minus average or higher to make honor roll because even though they have mastered those competencies and the trends absolutely went in the right direction, because they started here. But what we've told teachers is to use their professional judgment and they can, every teacher has the right to override that grade. I don't think that's happening. Is that, has that been happening? That is, no. Okay. Again. With, with, that's with training, piece. Okay. training mm -hmm. and support. I mean, yes. yes. What Mary's saying is that traditionally time is a constant. There's 180 days. There's so many minutes in mm -hmm. class, right? So time is right. a constant. And learning ends up being the variable. Some kids, learn really well in that time yeah. and some do Tough. not master versus now we want to shift it to you know the time is, is not as much a constant as the learning expectation so we want everybody to get there in the end and so the kid who starts off slow but accelerates and lands there should not be penalized for starting off a little bit slower and that's yeah. the yeah. challenge correct and you're right there are these other constructs like honor rolls um, mm -hmm. etc but you know as we sort of shift away from some of those throughout the year and more toward end, you know, honor roll maybe once a year. Maybe we just say honor roll is here as to where you landed at the end. Yeah. And, and the, the reality, yeah, I mean, those work study practices are, are huge with that. But I think I overestimated in some cases, you know, when we talk about I, I use the term because it, it, it sticks in my brain, but learning versus earning. Mm -hmm. um, it really needs to be about the learning. And because for some of us, that's always been our mentality, it was kind of shocking to me when I brought this, I asked this question in a meeting and I got significant pushback. Um, well, they can say that in college, they need to learn how to take a multiple choice test instead of make a project, but I say that's but happening that's, in college too. But that's about the learning. Exactly. It's not about, about the earning. The, the percentage yeah. or the number of points earned. And that really is, you know, it's a much bigger philosophical shift. Um, and it's not just with that, that to me is one coming in. I would have thought, yeah, we have to, we have to get that communicated to families. We need to, to get people to, but we have to start with the way we're instructing. Mm -hmm. um, and that really, it's, it's a big shift. We have a lot of work to do. We're doing great things and we're heading in the right direction, 
but there's still a lot to do. Mm -hmm. And if you have change is always difficult. If you could find like two more of me, yeah, that would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Clone me? Mm. No, we're all can't handle it. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you, Mary. Thanks, Mary. All right. And that brings us to the BA's update. Um, just a couple quick updates. Uh, in terms of the financials, there's a bunch of moving parts that are going on right now that I didn't want to provide any numbers tonight. I want accuracy. So over the next couple weeks, um, Ann's working on the, the PO management piece of it where we can close out all the POs for the year, do a final uh, run through that, and then uh, we'll zero in on what the final numbers or a draft of what the final numbers are going to look like pending the audit. Um, a couple other things in terms of year-end encumbrances and fund balance, I believe there's going to have to have, we're going to have to have another uh, discussion before June 30th. Uh, I've been approached by a couple people, the, the athletic director looking to pull money forward for uniforms. Um, he's providing me a quote. I'm not sure exactly what sports those are for at this point. And then also with um, the addition of a fifth kindergarten, uh, Mr. Mitchell will be looking to carry money forward to purchase uh, age appropriate furniture for those for those children for that classroom. Um, he's also going to provide me a quote for that. So we'll zero in on what the final numbers are going to look like, and we'll have to have a discussion about year end fund balance. And, and that will be the uniforms would be spend ahead for next year. Yeah, it would be pulling. Yeah, a year in encumbrance, pulling money from this budget into next year. But it's next in year. next year's budget. It. No, I don't think. I'm not sure that he's budgeted for. I'll have to have that conversation with him. Okay. Just a preliminary conversation with him to to get me numbers. Okay. Uh, in terms of the LMS project, uh, we received the draft guaranteed maximum price on that project for phase one. Um, I say draft because tomorrow there were some things that they noticed within it, some duplications that had to be revised. Um, so they're going to be presenting that to us again tomorrow. But at this point, we're at $1.6 million. Um, in order to fund that, due to some of the, the red tape that we're, we're facing uh, regarding the ESSER grants and getting those approved through the state. Uh, we would be looking to fund those through the fund balance that was carried forward on April 7th, which is about 800,000. And then the additional, uh, about, yeah, the, the other 800,000 through a mixture of the two capital reserves and uh, expendable trust funds that we have with the town. That way we can complete the project without having an impact on the taxpayers. Um, as I said, there, there is a million dollars in ESSER two and ESSER three funding that is being held up at the state. We haven't, we haven't been able, but we're looking to, since the, I think ESSER 2 goes through September of 2023, ESSER 3 goes through 2024. So we can use those on future projects related to things that we're doing uh, related to COVID. Also in terms of impact fees, I sent a letter to Steve Weber, the chair of the selectmen, um, to have the, the board of selectmen discuss uh, releasing those funds, the impact being the impact of COVID so we could do the, so have money towards those projects. Um, they are set to discuss that tonight at their meeting that they're, that's being held currently. So I'll have an update on that soon. Other than that, um, if anyone has any questions for me. Corey, I just want to clarify, you, you, that you gave a number of 1.6 million. Mm -hmm. That is for the LMS project. That's for phase one. For phase one. For the summer. I just yep. want to make sure I had the plan. Yep. And how much money are we getting back on that? What do you that, mean? Um, grants? If we can get grants, uh, well, we'd be looking to do phase two okay. utilizing grant funding because there's the states holding up Got it. approval of grant funding. Great. Any other questions mm -hmm. for Corey? 
So with all that being said, we may have to, uh, well, we're probably gonna have to set a date before June 30th to get us together to have a, a quick financial update and a vote. Okay. okay? Yep, thanks, Corey. Thank you. brought to attention, I'll just go through some of the, uh, the fact sheet that was given to us. Uh, HEAC projects at CHS and GMS and LMS are complete at this time. As far as what they will be completed, GMS was obviously the least amount of work done. Um, six weeks ago, they started collecting data uh, from all three schools that they now have in storage, and they'll start looking at that over the summer as far as fuel costs, usage, um, electricity, propane. <coughs> Let us know that as of today, which is June 9th, oil had increased 75% over last year. And obviously, it'll be an issue going forward based on today's prices. They expect uh, fuel 75%. to be. 75%. Yeah, they expect fuel to be at 280 a gallon. Uh, but again, it can fluctuate. From last year? Yeah. 75%. <clears throat> uh, and they just talked about the building management systems. That right now at CHS, they're able to view through a laptop or whatever mechanism they want to use, 100% CHS, I'm sorry, yeah, 100%, 80% of GMS and 22% of LMS. Um, and LMS obviously will be rectified once the work that Corey was touching on it gets completed. <coughs> and unfortunately at LMS they only have data from nine classrooms, which is 22%, because that's the only thing that has sensors. Uh, and again, once, once LMS is complete, then they'll have 100% oversight of LMS. Uh, and really, that's about it from this report. So the other two reports that are here, and I'll touch on them, and I'm sure Dr. Jetty will give you more information as needed. The first is the OPR, which is the Onus Project Requirements. Uh, this is an outline <coughs> of the scope of work for the design team for them to see what is involved and what is required as far as for the school. And the other is the RFQ, which is the architect um, proposals for an architect as far as what we're looking for um, in the school, in the design of the school. Uh, the architect is responsible for uh, overseeing the OPR and the design team. And both these documents need to be approved by us um, going forward so that we can start looking to hire an architect. And that's one of the things we talked about is, do we look for an architect who has been involved with um, the type of school we're looking for, or do we look for uh, an architect who's involved with designs of schools, um, and how far our search will be for an architect. I'm not sure what you want to add to that. Well, it's a, it's a very similar process to what we follow with the middle schools, so um, both designing the OPR and then doing the RFQ process. So a little bit different because we're not looking for proposals. We really are gonna contact firms that we know have the experience that we're looking for um, and inviting them to submit their qualifications into us. So it's, it's slightly truncated, but it will allow us to make sure that we have people on board who are uh, highly qualified. And if you look at the dates of those documents, they're dated tomorrow because we're hoping to get approval tonight so that we can get those pushed out and get going on the next phase of this uh, proposal. I had one small, small comment on the OPR. Mm -hmm. um, it's, there was a line that said it would include a gymnasium slash cafetorium. I think we need both of those. Is that in the Blissfield Elementary School? You know where that is? Um, it's uh, function under functional, functional uses. uses. Yep. It's um, the fifth bullet point down. Bear with me. Oh, is it an additional cut? No, so so it just outlines um, 
will provide spaces for learning, including, so there's a, a library slash media center, full size gymnasium slash cafetorium. But I think we want the gym and the cafeteria. I think you're right. Yeah, yes. separate. Rather yeah. than one multi purpose yeah. room. Yeah. It's a very, like I said, it's a very small thing, but. Not really. Makes a big difference. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, in, um, I want to be, because that's additional cost, right? So mm -hmm. just to be clear, if we list it out that way, um, you know, the cafeteria, which maybe in the evening ends up, you know, the gym ends up being used, but the cafeteria is empty or vice versa, versus the cafetorium is sort of that multi-purpose. Like an auditorium, space. it's not. Well, well think of like LMS has what I would call a cafetorium, right. because there's yeah. a stage off of a. In addition to a gym. Cafeteria, in addition yeah. to a gym. Right. Um, so you want me to just put a return after <coughs> gymnasium and then cafetorium? Yeah. I just want it to say and cafetorium. Right, that's what we have now. Right. We have a gym and then right. we have a cafetorium. So it's I'm, not anything in addition. We have a cap. Yeah, we have a cafe and we have a gym. We don't have oh, a sure. cafetorium. We have a gym so really right adding right a stage to, a, to a cafeteria. Right. Okay, and we have but, a but stage on the gym. Yes. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. Bedford, yeah. actually Bedford. Yeah. Yeah. Cafeteria. Cafeteria and a gymnasium. Can't we say I added a return. So look amazing. at the wording now. Yeah. It's full size gymnasium and then it's cafetorium. Yeah. So we are yes. combining <clears throat> the auditorium feature yeah. or the stage into the cafeteria. Yeah. And then once the architect comes back to applies and plus with his little cost, then we'll revisit. There you go. But let's design it with what you really want. Mm -hmm. and yeah. If that's what you want, we'll put it in. Well, I think the thing is too, when I read it, I guess I didn't see it as like one room. Oh. I saw it as a cafeteria and a gym, possibly an auditorium. But my first thought was, especially where the school is going to be located across an LMS, mm -hmm. that we can start utilizing that gym for LMS because LMS gym is too small. Mm -hmm. So we do a full size gym and then to utilize LMS for know, games and stuff. Not only for practices or things like that, not the games because the court's too small. Okay. Okay. So, um, I just I went to an elementary school that had a multi purpose room that was the cafeteria, the gym, and the auditorium, <laughs> mm -hmm. and that was that was inadequate. <laughs> it is. Yes. I think the other piece too is so, even though this sounds like extravagant you know the town is engaged if you look at the master plan there is conversation about uh dare hall and what you want to do with that well if you're providing the space within the town and we have a good relationship with rec leagues etc mm -hmm. using it um you know it's just let, let's provide the space and right well, just, why is that considered extravagant i mean it's what that's we what now. we have now i don't i don't think it's extravagant so did i say extravagant i thought you did yes Oh, no, I, I'm talking to some taxpayers who might see it as a Oh, I see. Well, the and thing is, I, I'm not saying from the you school. You can't stop okay. gym so four grades can eat lunch. Five right. grades can yeah. eat lunch. All right. No, gym. Okay. That was the only comment. I love that the I fact that there are going to be teaching solar panels on the ground. Mm -hmm. I think that that's a nice touch. Mm -hmm. um, but my only question was is giving people, giving people two weeks to quote out a whole brand new elementary school enough time? I feel oh, like they're not, not they're not quoting out the school. This is quali qualifications for the architect themselves before mm -hmm. the design phase. Oh. So picture an architectural okay. firm looks at this, you know, and firm Just A might steps. say, okay. net zero school, incorporating outdoor space into indoor, you know, that's not our thing. We do inner city schools that, um, you know, are totally grid connected and use a lot mm -hmm. of fossil fuels. That's our thing. I don't think many architect firms would say that. But <laughs> okay. the point is, right. the OPR is really saying where they're getting inside our head space. What is it we're really looking for as a rural town with a rural setting for the schools? Rural budget. And then they'll submit their qualifications. Yes, I can build this kind of school for you. 
Right. Mm -hmm. And so Just the there is the so much work to go okay. on this car before yeah. we ever see a plan or whatever right. it's like. Yeah. So okay. They're okay. just saying we're interested in this. Or, you know, there could be architectural firms right now that say we're interested in this, but we're, we're already booked out for a year and a half. Mm -hmm. We don't have a team with the capacity to follow this timeline. Um, and so we're going to tap out of the project because mm -hmm. we just we can't do it. Has everybody had a chance to review these two documents and are mm -hmm. you ready mm -hmm. to make them to approve them so we can get that ball rolling? All right. I'll make a motion to approve the new Litchfield Elementary School OPR and the RFQ for the architect. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Five zero zero. And then so, the commissioning agent. Do you want to talk a little bit about the elements commission? Brian, did you want to hit it first and then I'll? <clears throat> yeah, um, so my understanding as far as the commission agent, it, it's going to be uh, someone that's independent, I believe it will report to the architect and to yourself, correct? Directly, yeah. Yeah. But they, they work directly to the owner. Correct. And the owner is Our Dr. Son. Jeff. No, all of us, the school district. The school district. <laughs> <laughs> but, He's so, not making the payments on this. Right, so just think of it as like an independent uh, overseer of the project. Um, we had conversations and we do not believe that they had a um, commissioning agent for this particular building. That's why some of the problems that have been uncovered would have been uncovered with the commissioning agent. That's their responsibility to see, have oversight of the project, just to make sure like things are going right. Not so much as uh, a foreman, say, on the job. They're overseeing a foreman on the job. Right. They would test the system yeah. to make sure everything's working correctly. Right. Just testing calibrate and mm -hmm. work with the construction company to make sure everything's working. So, you know, they put a nice, right, they put a nice handy dandy, you know, um, <coughs> HVA system in, in all the components and, like, we, you know, the people who are putting it in and then come to find out we don't know how to run it. Mm -hmm. And we don't even know if it's running. Or in the GMS's case, we didn't know there was one there. <laughs> so uh, it, it's, some, my understanding, very short money um, and is highly recommended in this type of project and the scope of it. The, um, the estimated cost in the is about, is about $20,000. But I, I can guarantee you in 20 years' time, you know, average that out, it would have been $1,000 a year. We have wasted more than that with energy costs in the building because stuff was not adjusted right. So um, it was cut from the high school project as near as we can tell. Given the nature of some of the um, things that were uncovered this past year, there's no way they had a commissioning agent involved. <laughs> and so we, unfortunately, you know, it was cut as a cost savings, but the taxpayers have more than paid for that cut. We want to do it right and have that independent third party working We'll make a, I'll make a motion to approve the RFP for an LMS commissioning agent. I'll second. second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Five zero zero. to be moving along. <laughs> I had 100 miles an hour. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> no looking back now. That's right. All right, we have some policies to review. I have one more meeting. Oh, first. sorry. We had an emergency meeting on 6-4. Uh, uh, you're so busy. You're so busy. <laughs> I know. <clears throat> <laughs> there wasn't a lot to it, uh, but one of the things that was discussed was the secure campus, and we went through that, uh, what occurred and what took place, and one of the ideas that was kicked around is because, and I, I think I brought it up in the meeting when Bill was here, is the late arrival students like knowing what to do. So that was right. part of what yeah. they discussed. But also that some schools have done in some buildings that there's a, like a warning. It could be a light, mm -hmm. a bell, something oh, on the yeah. outside. They yeah. like that. Right, so as you're approaching the building, you yeah. see this green light or yeah. whatever color it is, and you know not to enter the building. Oh, a green, mm -hmm. wow. Yeah, I so, think that's a, a good idea. That's something I, 
I think they're going to look at this year if it's you know, feasible. All the schools are getting like new phone updates that possibly can be tied into that. I'm not sure if they can or not. Um, it's pretty interesting though. Some of the stuff you find out. We just talked about the commissioning agent, and one of the things that I think the fire meeting that the middle school was talking about that when they lost power, and they're sending the kids up here, and of course they lose their phones and everything else. But come to find out, they have this little box that you open it up and you know you do whatever you have to do, and you pick up the phone and you can talk over the PA system. So. Dr. Jenny inquired more, you know, do you have one? She was like, no, let me find out. So she has been in the building for how long? Mari, couldn't yeah. Jeff? Yeah. Uh, four or five Four. Years. Five, I think. Okay. Maybe four. But yeah, then, you're not aware that that exists. exist. Oh so gosh. she went searching for it. <laughs> and she found it, I believe it's in the uh, maintenance office. <laughs> so she found it. Then she found this big box of keys. And thank God it's all labeled. So she found the key to open the thing. Uh, yeah. <coughs> and then she went through the process of there's all kinds of different steps you have to take before the phone works. So I said, yeah, maybe we can look into simplifying, maybe updating, getting the phone, you just pull it out and start talking. But uh, so you have buildings, and I'm sure this one has one also, that they all have you know, a mechanism of being able to communicate to students and, st and staff if they uh, will lose power. If you look at the red, uh, so. The you know, if the fire alarm was pulled, the strobe would blink, yeah. and that red box has a speaker in it. Mm -hmm. So that's the independent emergency yeah. system yeah. Okay. that we now are trained on how to utilize, and Laura has found uh, yeah. at Griffin. Uh, good. So <clears throat> along with, you know, possibly having a light outside, then was also conversation as far as uh, the badges just being shut down. Mm -hmm. So again, you can't enter. Uh, but is there any way to, for kids to get a notification like parents do? Is that like... Well, that's... Something we talked about yeah. also is that, especially like in Bill's case here at the high school, yeah. I mean, it was it was kind of like, you know, nerve wracking, and he was like pretty tied up in, in doing so. So sure. we talked about almost like a buddy system that you know maybe right. LMS will then take over, mm -hmm. yeah. because it seems right. like you know the only other person in the building or different buildings is like one other person that has control of right. can mm -hmm. be able to reach parents, but that mm -hmm. person's involved with taking care of the building right. itself. Right. So, you know, possibly like just calling down. You know, to LMS say, hey, listen, can you send contact? But come to find out, nobody really has the contact list. So that's something that I'm not sure if yeah. you look into it, but you find out whether or not the other admin teams can have that. Hmm. That makes sense. And of course, Dr. Jetty was showing everybody, oh no, you just go here and just repopulate. Nope. Yeah. It's not that easy. It's not that easy. Yeah. So. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> and they also talk about Alice girls that uh, were not done in May, but again, there was a conversation of once school starts back up, we just get you know pulled back into it. We've already had a couple you know secure shutdowns of this building, so there's obviously a need. Yeah. And then, and so I wrote down bomb threat. I, I don't recall. Do we have that in our uh, plan now, or are you working on a bomb threat? Say that threat? again. Say that yeah. again. Bomb, bomb threat, threat. Annex. Uh, no, we we used to have it in there. Right. So we took it out else. because of skin in place, and now they want us to put it back in. Just one last reminder. Uh, so the kitchen project at LMS is not included in all the other work that we're doing. So when Corey's talking numbers, the kitchen project is sort of a pullout, um, but we now have two quotes on the cooler. And actually the preferred way of doing it is the less expensive way of doing it. So we feel very good about that. Um, and we're in the process of getting all that pulled together. So you'll get more details on the kitchen project it looks like it's going to phase over two years. So phase one is sort of demoing out the cooler, getting the new cooler in place, um, and then really studying what we want that kitchen to look like, and we'll come back for a second phase to it. And that'll that'll look like uh, David even brought up working with a, a commercial kitchen design mm -hmm. to get it so we do it right. Yeah. And now I figured it out exactly when we walk through it. Yeah. Changing it. Yep. Yeah. So well, we do want to we want to make sure we're as efficient as possible. <coughs> Well, and, and again, fresh eyes on it. Dick Henry came in and said, the size of the hood is way oversized. Mm. And he said, for what you have to have underneath the hood, it's removing so much warm air from the kitchen that it's just unnecessary to have that. So, mm. you know, so that, again, there are features that, that it'll result in energy savings by having a properly sized hood. Mm. What called bar rescue? Hmm? Bar called bar rescue. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if they do school kitchens. <laughs> I like John's hat, though. <laughs> <laughs> Give a call.
It's worth the show. He's a character. Do you have anything else? Any other committee uh, reports? No. Nope. All right. So let's move on to policy review. Um, we have a first read of GB, GBA, use of AEDs, GB, JA, HIP policy. Here it is. What? It just reapproves. Right. You said first. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep, reviews. Uh, GCAA highly qualified teachers and GCB professional staff contracts. And GBK. And GBK. Complaint did policy. I skip that one? I'm sorry, I'm right <laughs> over it. GBK. I did. Uh, complaint policy. Did anybody have questions or comments on any of those? No. I had one question about highly, highly qualified teachers. Mm -hmm. um, is that still a thing? <laughs> well, it's, it's no longer in the federal law. Okay. But it's still in the NHSBA policy, not right. a policy. But do policy. teachers seek highly qualified status? Is, is that a thing they need to attain? Or no. can attain? No. Just say yes. Yeah. We no longer, you know, they're able to teach outside of their majority assignments as long as it's a minority. minority. Right. Okay. So it's no longer pursuant to federal law. I, I think we just rescind this policy. Right? I mean, it says that we will notify parents and guardians whose children are not being instructed by a highly qualified teacher. Does it, does it make sense to keep this policy if there's no such thing as a highly qualified teacher? That would make sense to me. Let, <laughs> let us ask that question because what I yeah. worry about, so I'm looking at it and it's like, you know, no child left behind has been replaced by every student succeeds. Yes, right. So that's no longer the policy. Um, it's defined by the state of New Hampshire though. Yeah, and I also worry that the other two cit citations at the end mm -hmm. um, might still, you know, sometimes the federal law doesn't always catch up with other changes. so. Mm -hmm. Let us do a little bit of checking and get back to you if you want to park this one. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, I'll park it. It's interesting they still have it in the policy manual. They do, and mm -hmm. the citations are still there. Mm -hmm. So I was actually going to question that, but you made me do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, haha. -ha. So GCAA, GCAA. will we'll hold on. All right. So I will make a motion to approve, to reapprove policy GBGBA. GBJA, GBK, and GCB. I'll second. Tara seconded. All in favor of doing that? Aye. Uh, okay. Opposed? Abstain? Those are reapproved, 500. We have a first reading on policy GBEBC, GBEBB, GBI, GBJ, and GBGB. Those are fun to say. <laughs> any questions or comments on any of those? I just have a clarification. Um, what about staff asking for gifts on social media for their room supplies? Like I saw some of those posts last year, and I'm wondering how does that fall within this guideline? Should that be considered a Gift to the district. Uh, I said it last year, and I'll dinner? say it. Uh, I said it last year, and I'll say it again. We shouldn't have teachers having to ask for tissues. I know. I agree. That we should supply them tissues. We should supply them wipes. Mm -hmm. Those are the kind of things they shouldn't be asking for tissues. If anything, we should require students to bring a box of tissues in for themselves. I know. I the, the example I remember the the. Um, the staff member was asking for something for a classroom that was not supply related. Right. It was mm -hmm. uh, like a like computer a accessory. Computer or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember that. No, I don't. I personally don't think they should be asking for them. Do we but have this is more this is gifts we're talking about? I know, but if they're asking for it and then they get that, is it considered a gift to them? Or does it have to come to the board to be accepted <laughs> like other procedures? For gifts. I don't believe it's a gift at all. I think it's, but I think it's a more of a donation compliance. Yeah. Yeah. Which but is this policy, they should not be 
soliciting as to this policy as well. Yep. She can always solicit. Okay, so that's all right. So that what what happens if No organization so right. shall solicit funds. Teachers asking for donations. What about the teacher? Teacher. I mean, a couple of little supplies here and there. I mean, that's been basically. No, but the, uh, the policy itself doesn't, it's not about staff soliciting anything from. No, it's about the staff anybody. being about, solicited. Right. right. No, it's about organizations soliciting staff members. Right. Yeah. But there are policies. I think we had this discussion at some point about. Teachers looking for either funds or supplies or materials outside of asking through the district. Right. Um, last year when that came yeah. up. Yeah, I thought we had a. We did. Was we there a policy, policy around that? About that. that wasn't mm -hmm. this one? But I think there is. Yeah. I, have to look. I think I that's think addressed to the other. Okay. okay. All right. Let, let, let us find that and bring it forward because that, that's another policy that's good to remember at the start of the year. Yeah. So, uh, we'll, we'll drag that out. Shouldn't they be I remember your wife's speech. Yeah. That was a good one. Okay. So, I'll make a motion to approve the first three G E E B C, G B E B D, G B I. <laughs> what about the Bee Gees? Yeah. We already did those. I'll second. Oh, I'm the chair. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? First read approved, 500. Second reading on EBCG and JLCG. I'll make a motion to accept. Second read E B C G and J L C G. All second. All in favor? Oh, any discussion or questions? No. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Abstain. Second reading approved. Um, and I'll make a motion to rescind policy G B G A A slash R, the bloodborne pathogens procedures. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Five zero zero. That brings us to the coronavirus review and update. So just uh, as, as the school year winds to a close, we are in very good shape. I will let the board know that we are going to have held 180 days worth of COVID daily briefings. Mm -hmm. um, and we're committed to staying to Thursday, even if it's a clap out of the COVID daily briefing. <laughs> we're, we're done with it. But our numbers are currently all at zeros. We're in really strong shape. However, in uh, the superintendent, regional superintendent meeting on Friday, one of the superintendents not far from us was talking about three active cases in his schools. Mm. Um, contact tracing resulting in multiple quarantines of students so you know we just can't get uh, too confident in our record at the current time because there are active cases taking place in other other schools nearby so we're fortunate that we have the good news to share um, and uh, but not all schools are in that position so and it's certainly not time to drop our guard not time to drop our guard um, so that will bring us to our reopening plan and if you click on the link I just want to walk you through what we have here so I dubbed it COVAX 21 because I'm done with COVID-19 I'm ready to be <laughs> looking forward uh, with our reopening plan for next year you'll see that I titled it also version 1 and we are very clearly marking it that um, we expect that this plan is going to morph and change over the summer as we get more information shared with us. Some of the things that we're predicting in here, we really have to wait till August to know exactly what the conditions are on the ground. Um, so we broke it up into two main areas, the key instructional strategies and then the key mitigation strategies. So if you look at the instructional piece, we are um, acknowledging right out of the gate that in-person learning we believe is better than remote learning for most of our students. 
And so we're going to continue to offer highly engaged, highly engaging direct instruction as our primary means of teaching and learning. We do acknowledge that remote learning has uh, had benefits for us this year. Um, however, it has to be properly designed and properly resourced in order to be effective. So the district will look at remote instruction when school-based teams have determined that it is in a student's best interest due to medical necessity. And we also anticipate that uh, remote learning may be used whenever it is not safe to attend school. So if we end up in a quarantine of a class or what have you, we will then have to use remote learning as our primary means of instruction. Um, or weather emergencies, we still need to work with our associations on the concept of snow days for next year. Um, but we believe that there's a role for remote learning in that conversation. Um, Google Classroom has proven to be our, uh, an effective learning management system. And so we expect that that will continue for the delivery of curriculum instruction and assessment. And our teachers are really committed to that. We will need to provide ongoing PD and support for them um, so that they you know, can stay in that realm of the technology driven way of managing um, and not migrate back toward worksheets or other uh, more traditional means. So we want to make sure that we stay in that uh, technology environment. We also feel that the emotional and physical well-being of our staff and students needs to be emphasized into the future. And we're really paying attention to equitable access to support services and especially mental health and instructional interventions and support. So a lot of the conversation that we've had earlier tonight is about equity and we want to continue to emphasize equity. Um, and then finally, including and actively supporting collaborative planning time for staff in the daily schedule at each school is an important uh, feature for us going forward. We know that when everybody's working together and pulling together on on instructional goals that all the students benefit from that. So um, in particular, as we identify and address learning gaps. So we have to remember that our students, uh, learning gaps are individualized, so not all students have experienced the same level of learning gaps. But as we look at uh, test data and so forth, we want to make sure that we continue to work collaboratively to address those learning gaps because um, we don't want anybody falling behind. And then in terms of key mitigation strategies, we hit on some key bullet points here. So uh, best practices, so we want to continue to follow guidelines and recommendations that come forward from New Hampshire Department of Public Health or New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services um, as they publish those for public schools. So we'll stay up to date on that information. We're gonna to continue to examine local and state data points because we believe that has helped us to stay ahead of the curves and know what's going on around us. Um, and we agreed today to shift to a weekly COVID update so that we'll uh, continue to have weekly meetings uh, just to make sure that we're aware of what's going on around us. So schools will still track things like attendance on a daily basis, but we will only meet to review that on a, on a weekly basis unless we get into another scenario where we need to pay more attention. Um, personal responsibility has worked really well for us this year and we want to continue to emphasize that so the daily health screener um, we'll keep that up to date for families and parents uh, and, and students to know um, whether they should be coming to school or not uh, physical distancing I think we've all learned to stay out of each other's personal space and it's something that we will continue to attempt to implement in the classroom we're not going to be um, as strict about it as we have been this year, but we still want to make sure that physical distancing is something that we can uh, encourage and use whenever possible. We believe that masks have been effective this year, um, and we're just going to follow current protocols for masking. So if DHHS is recommending the wearing of masks for non-vaccinated students or students who don't have access to it, we will also continue to recommend that. Um, and we'll encourage students and staff to wear masks when they're helpful toward protecting the health of self and others. So it's really going to vary greatly on by August. Um, you know, currently we have students who are ages 12 and up who have had access to be fully vaccinated. Um, so what is it that happens? So that splits our middle school, by the way. That's, that's about half the middle school population. So what are we seeing take place over the summer so that we can make an informed decision about masks? Um, you know, if we're able to vaccinate students 10 and up, then the middle school 
has a viewpoint that is perhaps different from other schools. Um, but again, the it, it'll really be based upon where we land as we come into the opening of school time. And I think forevermore, uh, you know, if somebody two years ago came into school wearing a mask, I think people would have just been like shocked. Why are you wearing a mask? What's going on here? I don't think that's going to be the case in the future. I think if a student came in wearing a mask, nobody's going to bat an eyelash at it because they're just, they, they realize that that's somebody exercising that personal responsibility. And then finally, hand washing and hand sanitizer, which we have plenty of. Uh, we will continue to teach that. Um, really our nurses taking on just respiratory etiquette and making sure that everybody's aware of what protocols we expect um, and we'll keep that emphasis going in the, in the future. Um, we've got effective communication so we've got the whole variety of tools that are available to us. We've learned how to uh, communicate with parents and families and students and we'll continue to um, anticipate and communicate situations going forward. For vaccines, um, we are recognizing that that is a highly personalized decision and it should be left up to each individual and family. Um, we do acknowledge that vaccines have been proven effective in preventing the spread of COVID-19, but we are not going to take the stance that we require vaccines for any students or staff, nor will we have any practices in our schools that will separate out students who are vaccinated from the unvaccinated. Um, we will support things like clinics and sharing of information and medical uh, documentation from our nurses, et cetera, will continue to promote and to share that and then let people make their own individual decisions and accept the consequences of the decisions that they make relative to vaccine. For facilities, um, we're recognizing that our schools are part of our community and they are a tremendous asset. And so our goal is to open them as much as possible. We will make case by case decisions about uh, visitors, volunteers, and community groups, uh, depending upon what the environmental conditions are at the time. So our goal right now is to make them as accessible as possible, um, but realize that depending on how things shift throughout the summer, we may have to be a little bit more uh, strict to um, the usage and access to the facilities. Cleaning. Uh, we will continue to meet cleaning on a daily basis and we will follow all the guidelines that are established for public schools and facilities. And then finally, funding. We are recognizing that we have had a combination of federal and local funds. Um, we believe that providing fresh air into our buildings by enhancing our ventilation systems is a, is a critical strategy, not just for COVID, but for every other airborne illness that comes along, common cold, um, influenza, you name it. Um, so we will continue to invest in our <coughs> infrastructure to make sure that going forward, whatever the next airborne illness is that comes along, that we're prepared to provide as much fresh air as possible for it. So I walked you through all the key aspects of the plan. It's a, it's literally a one pager front and back. Um, we will be making links as we go along. So as this takes on other versions, we'll provide links to the current guidance and so forth. But linking stuff now that may be obsolete in six weeks didn't make a lot of sense, so we sort of left it out. But that's our general direction and where we're headed on it. This has to be submitted to the uh, New Hampshire Department of Ed, or a plan has to be submitted to the New Hampshire Department of Ed by uh, the 23rd. And part of the plan has to be that we've provided an opportunity for public input. So again, our, our goal is to um, put this out in front of parents, asking them for feedback on it and telling them how they can provide us feedback so that as the summer emerges, you know, we're able to uh, shift this plan into what it looks like come August. We are not envisioning another mega committee. So <coughs> last summer, there were so many unknowns that we just needed stakeholders and voices to be involved in it. At this point, I think we have a fairly good handle on, on the way things are, and we're not envisioning that we have that level of committee involvement uh, going forward. The 23rd of July? 23rd of June. Of June. And, and that's why I've worded this with, and even added the footer in it, it's going to change. But oh, we have okay. to have something in I front see. of them, um, and there's a whole template 
of uh, think boxes that we have to check. One of those is that we have provided, it's really bizarre, because even the wording of the federal thing is, or it might be a state thing, is strange, because it says, before, before making it publicly available, you provided the public with an opportunity for input. And I'm like, well, if it's not publicly available, what are they providing input on? So, I think we put this out there. I, I guess, I, I mean, we've been listening to our public all along. We've had parents who have been writing to us and providing us with input. I think this kind of addresses most of what we've been hearing um, in a way that, you know, I don't want to come out yet and say, here's our definitive answer on masks, mm -hmm. when, you know, variant, I don't know what they're calling it, variant X or whatever the mm -hmm. latest variant is, we don't even know what that's going to do um, in the next two months. And so, you know, if, if there were to be a variant that emerges that the vaccine is not effective against, that's a game changer for all of us. And I think we just have to know that and, and not back ourselves into a corner with a plan now that somebody is pointing to um, when we're trying to shift that plan toward the conditions. Well, very similar to our, this year's plan. It, it's just subject to change, and it's going to. Let's hope it all changes in a more positive direction and negative direction, but it's no different than this past year's MOA. It, it changed on a bi-weekly basis almost as far as what was accepted, what wasn't accepted, and what could be done. <clears throat> I think it's just good, you know, a basic brief overview that um, just capsulizes this year's MOA a little bit, you know, that breaks it down. And like I said, we know a lot more right now. So it's... So the next step is you're going to send this out with a, a link or a you know, request for input? I think similar to the middle school schedule, we'll ask yeah. parents to provide us input on this um, and just get a sense from them. And, and we have to remember, we have parents all over the spectrum. There are parents who are, who are actually pushing us to be more open than perhaps we're comfortable with. And there are parents who are saying, whoa, 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 slow it down. We're not quite there yet. So. Um, I think this hits the middle ground. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I hope there was nothing in there that had you say, where did that come from? Um, because yeah. really our, our attempt is to get as normal as possible. Um, that's really what we want to strive toward, recognizing that we still have to be aware of what's going on and able to respond and nimble to respond. I had a, just a, you know, the, the, par the part about remote learning and if it's properly resourced, um, I think I think our staff is waiting to hear that we're not going to continue with synchronous learning. Um, is that what we mean by resourcing remote learning properly? So, um, so we are not going to ask for blended synchronous learning across the board. If there's a student with a medical necessity who the team feels like, you know, here's this child in this medical situation, we need to provide uh, remote learning. <coughs> At this point, I think teachers have become so accustomed to open up the screen, open up the classroom, that they can do that pretty easily. That's not gonna be a learning curve for folks because they have been doing it, but it's not gonna be a daily expectation unless the school approves it in those cases. Properly resourced to me means um, that if we were to have uh, an entire group of students who needed this, that we would then have to figure out how to provide that without putting one more thing on the plates of, of our teaching staff. So <coughs> how, how, how are you going to determine that? I mean, I just envision like something, like as you're talking, like, I'm home with the flu. I want to not be remote. You know, just, it, 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 it could be, it could be class. I mean, it, 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 exactly. Team deemed medically necess a medical necessity, meaning more or less it would follow, um, you know, we we're looking at a lot of policy today, but around like, homebound students, things that are, it would, it couldn't just be, oh, I have the flu and I need to stay home. Uh, it's well, more, it's, it's more the, yeah. How about someone, right, <coughs> excuse me, that has underlining medical issues, that's why they're not in school right now, will the same thing happen next year? So, w there's two policies, IHBF, which is homebound instruction, that was last visited by the board in 2010. 
our goal is to actually Michelle's here for the first time, but to have that back in front of you in July um, because we feel like that's one that we really need to re-examine. It's quite outdated, actually. Mm -hmm. um, it actually, it, it, the policy itself reads okay, but there's um, wording around special ed law that is updated. And the other one is policy IFA, which is the instructional needs for students with disabilities. And that's another one that we need to get forward pretty quickly. <coughs> we want to make sure that that, that was last updated in 2009. Um, that's the one that has conflict with, I think, special ed law. I think the other one. No, the, the, there was language in the homebound one that Both conflicts, them? yeah. So I, I'm assuming, and I think Brian is getting, his, this is the point Brian is making, that if, you know, if I have an extended absence or if I'm out for a few days, we have a policy about making up work right. and right. Like teachers right. making sure that that gets completed. So no. we would rely on that. Correct. First Correct. And foremost. I think the difference is that the kid that gets the flu probably ought to be home resting mm -hmm. and not trying to do school. Uh, versus the kid who is feeling healthy, but we have said you must quarantine. And so even though that quarantine period may not result in an illness, uh, you know, we had an obligation by saying you can't come to school, so we're gonna provide this to you. Yeah. And again, I think we're gonna know an awful lot more come, uh, come August in terms of what are we envisioning for quarantine? So we're gonna be quarantining, you know, one kid a month, I mean, this year right. we were quarantining, my goodness, there were time periods where we had 20, 30 20 students kids. per That's school. That's a whole different yeah. ball game when right. you're talking right. about a right. switch. So my other part of the question for this, is this something we'll need to get approved and get an MOA to sign? Um, so remember, the MOA came about because we said, this is what we're gonna do. And then it was bargaining over the impact of that decision. So. I think what we have to do is see exactly what the decision is, because the MOAs were not signed with the associations until October, I believe. Mm -hmm. So um, I think part of it is where does it land? And if there's the question about resourcing, um, you know, we may have to find, uh, so for example, in the past, a student becomes ill, we have hired somebody to, to tutor the student. And that's, so it's not everybody has responsibility for tutoring, here's the tutor. And I, I think that's the type of thing that we would have to figure out based upon um, actually what the condition is. Mm -hmm. well, the reason I asked you, it was, it was very clear that the MOAs were one year. Mm -hmm. Those MOAs expire on June 30th. So remote learning, So that they're not even there. Right, we will have to get a new MOA because of the remote learning if we are looking to add the weather piece, correct? That's, that's a separate sidebar. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, this is actually the first share of this. So the admin team has talked about it, strengthened it. The next thing we have to do is share this with our employee group so that they understand what, what it is that we're trying to do and what questions or concerns do they have and give us a chance to work through those. Mm -hmm. But I think, to be clear, because you're right, Concern is, will we be asking our teachers to, on a daily basis, have blended synchronous learning? And the answer is no. That is not the expectation. So um, they may come down for that. If, in, I, I certainly hope not. But I mean, if <coughs> if we have an outbreak, right. and if we're back to kind of where we were, then we may have to say that, and then we have to make, mm -hmm. we may have to launch into another MOA. Um, but <coughs> right now, we do not envision. Anybody from the public here? And I jumped back into the public meet link, and there was nobody waiting for us. It was right. just for me. So, can I ask a question? That's we're talking about community forum. Are we going to continue with having the opportunity for them to do it through Google Meet, or are we going to have them, if we are in this setting, have them in person only? 
or once we go to town hall. Has town hall changed the um, uh, number of people uh, allowed in the room? We'll back, sure, we'll talk discuss about it tonight, right? Effective tonight, um, yeah, the selectmen had to approve, but in the town, uh, town call we called today, they were discussing the capacity of the town meeting when we'd be 17. Mm -hmm. um, Why can't we go to the firehouse where there's a bit much bigger It's not room? open yet. But they said even, even the capacity in the firehouse, the room with social distancing, you're still looking at 16 to 17 people. Mm -hmm. It's better than none. So yeah. it's five extra people. Yeah. yeah. And we it's were never at none. Right. <clears throat> so that okay. means if there's more than that, they can wait out the hall and take charge. It's a hallway. So nice. again, so will we stop okay. the Google, Google Meet phone in? So it's sort of at the pleasure of the board. Um, it's it's been a tool for us. It's something that it, actually we're very accustomed to doing at this point. I think if the board wanted to continue it, we could. Um, in, if you want to go back to pre-COVID expectations and say you come to the meeting and speak in public, we can do that also. So, you know, it, the same thing is uh, even though the emergency order is over, if a board member is unable to make a meeting, we can still use the tool. And so right now we have the dual meetings running. Uh, so Bill and Tom, I was able to say to both of them, hop in, um, hop, hop in when you're needed and then hop out when you're not needed. Saving them a night out, yeah. and you know, sitting in the audience waiting. Um, Devin from uh, our special ed director is available, or will be joining us in non-public on a, on a student issue tonight. Mm -hmm. And again, I was able to say to Devin, don't wait from the start of the meeting at five o'clock until eight o'clock when we get there. I'll send you a text when we're ready, and you can pop in then. So I think those tools are useful, but it's really up to the board on whether you want to continue that or not. But I, I can see them <coughs> being very useful. Like you just described, I'm, I'm just asking as far as for public input. Well, yeah, I know we haven't had a lot of community input in through the Google Meet, but I think it's a tool for people sitting at home, you know, who may not be able to hop in their cars and drive down to town hall. I support keeping the technology. Yeah, I do as well. I support it too. I prefer in person, but if we have to keep it, we can keep it. Do we, do you want, do you want to vote or? I don't think we need to. No. Yeah. No. So why don't we continue the practice okay. that we've had yep. until somebody makes a motion to discontinue that practice. Yeah. Otherwise, I think what we have done has proven to be pretty effective and helpful. And yeah. um, you know, we'll know if it starts to get abused or sure. mm -hmm. um, yeah. you know, certainly if we have an incident of some sort with it, but we haven't yet, it's been a good community tool. I don't think we need to continue the join by phone. Um, that has just been a source of confusion for us in the meeting. I think having the Google Meet and the... Um, they still have two options. Yeah. Yeah. It's not a number as soon as you make a meet, right? Yeah. Oh, it, it does? Okay. It's oh, a okay. okay. It, it gives you both and... Um, so when somebody shows up and it's their phone number mm -hmm. in the meet, I think they dial the phone number. Right? Oh, okay. So, so it's so not. Keep it. So if you remember yeah. initially, Jason had the funky phone on the table, mm. yeah. and mm -hmm. people could call into that line. Right. We stopped that. We're out yeah. of that business. Good, because that's confusing. Now I can dial the number and then sort of join in that way, um, but it is different. Okay. Yeah. All right. Never mind. Never. So it's not an additional step for you, right. necessary. Right. Okay. This for just to I can join remotely as long as I it's a short remote. meeting. Uh, the last <clears throat> one. Yeah, be remote? All right. So I mean, if is this a one agenda meeting? One yeah, agenda. Okay. Finance, I think. <coughs> yeah. Do you need to use the 
you need okay. approval Can from the board on that reopening? <laughs> 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 yeah, right. You don't need a, a vote on that? So, and what date was going to change the election? <clears throat> uh, so, I, I'm going to propose Wednesday the 30th. That is the last date, then you're meeting the requirement. If we did a, what's the earliest people could meet on okay. Wednesday the 30th? Eight. What's the score again? Earliest. <laughs> Summer vacation. This is like final, final financials. Uh, just for that. Yeah. yeah. One one item. Anytime. And, and remote is allowed, so we can literally accommodate it during the day if we need to. Corey will be remote, but, um, you know, one o'clock in the afternoon. Is that doable for people? That's gross. Is it 2 30? <laughs> It's to have votes recorded. Any yeah. voice have any oh, votes have oh, to be recorded okay. on the 30th. They cannot be recorded after. Okay. If you can't vote on July 1st to do something in sure. the previous fiscal right. year, so you have to vote by the 30th. Sure. What do you want to do, like, oh, 5 sure. o'clock? Or 9 a.m.? That's work for me. I don't want to work on this thing. Like, right? What do you, uh, is morning better? Like, I'm, I'm, I don't have a job in the summer, so. Um, I'm just concerned about football I'll work to make sure that I, Although I can call in from the car, so. My boys do. Well, I'm the their chauffeur. They need to stop doing sprints from the house. <laughs> I know. It's a drop off. It's, what's better, morning or? Evening? Yeah, it doesn't really matter. I can do either. I would need to do remote for if it was morning, but if it's evening, I can be in person. Okay. So yes. whatever's easier. The only thing I'm looking at is that morning. Mm -hmm. So that's the end of the NHSAA conference. I was not planning to go up to the conference. However, that morning, they I have to double check the agenda. They might actually have a meeting that I, I would want to go up okay. for. Um, so it's not going to be long. It's like we just do like four or five o'clock at night. Yeah, let's yeah, do five just to be consistent. I just don't feel like doing like smack in the middle of, you know. Yeah. Right. right. Let's just do five just to be consistent. So it's on a Wednesday, it's at 5 p.m. Yep. That would work. And, and I may be remote, because if I've been in Whitefield in the morning, I may okay. not come down. So. Um, Should we just say it will be remote? You know, that's not a bad idea, because. Can we do, can we do meetings all remote? I thought. The law change so that we can't now. Let me ask. Well, we just, if we set the date last night, then I, we can ask about that. I think the majority of the board has to be in person, mm -hmm. and then you can have two people remote. Well, I think. I, I, I assume town hall, but I don't Yeah, if we yeah, get town hall, question. let's just do town hall. People who can't make it's it to town hall. Can call in. All right. Someone has to be in charge of the Zoom. It's up in my screen, but it won't be you guys. <laughs> <laughs> so the 30th at 5. 30th at 5. Yep. All right. Um, I lost my agenda, but I believe we are going into non public. We are going into non public. That's the thing. All right. Um, the dismissal, promotion, or compensation of any public employee or the dismissal.